So you don't hear me say that because it wasn't being recorded, but it's true. MRS lies. Five bedrooms is really four bedrooms. It's uh, this area is not that area. So until you see it, you don't know what it really is. And I know for me, when I started doing rentals and I started seeing lots of houses, it really opened up a whole new picture to me of what being in real estate is, getting into houses, using the log boxes, calling the other agents and arranging, arranging showing times and stuff like that. When you start doing those things, you start doing things you're going to do as an agent, and it's a lot better to do them by yourself than have a client there with you, and you're not knowing what's going on, you're fumbling with the log box, the ones that the combination that don't open always have a screwdriver or a knife with you because they, they get stuck a lot. And so those things you learn by seeing houses. And it's better to learn them by yourself than with that client with you. They don't understand most of the time if something happens, things happen. But still, it's better to do it on your own, learn all the quirks. There's still going to be things that happen later, too. But going into houses and the clients, the tenants, not supposed to be there, and they're there cooking dinner. And so those are the things you can deal with as, you, as you're an agent. And I'm sure, like I said, I'm still very, very new. Tim probably has lots of stories he could share on those kind of things. But um, on things that are not expected to be there that are there or not thing. So by seeing the houses and going and start that process, even if it's one a day, two a day, that's going to really get you, especially, too, that's how you get to know your area. If you want to be a certain area you want to focus on, <coughs> excuse me. there's no way you can know that area unless you know the houses that are being sold, that have sold, why they're selling and start comparing, that really comes to play today on when you're doing your CMAs, because that's how you determine what's the pri best price for those areas. And so as far as expectations for today, we're going to study the market fundamentals to discover top pricing strategies for pricing property. Learn to do a CMA that will support the pricing methodology. Learn the pricing correlation scripts and objection to handlers, objection handlers. And then discover standards and techniques to deliver a great CMA and your price recommendation. So that's what basically the first session is going to be. We're doing two sessions today, uh, price to sell and then sell your listing. And we have the great honor and privilege to have Mr. Tim Pearson, who is one of the top producers in the office, top team in the office, that will be with us today. Um, so without any further ado, I'll, if you're ready, yeah. turn it over to Tim Pearson. All right, guys. You got to unfortunately use this just for the online folks. Okay. Show me while you transfer. All right, welcome everyone. Let's see how we do. Yep. So you did the handwritten notes, head in the game. Yeah, they just Okay. Right. Okay, so we're going straight to get your head in the game. Okay. Okay, what determines the price of a home? What do you guys think? Certainly. Yep. Anything else you guys can think of? The man? Certainly. Okay. So it, it, the statement here it says the pricing is a large mindset component both for you and your seller. So we got to make sure we understand exactly what um, is going to figure out or what's going to determine what this house should sell for. And a lot of that has to do with um, I think there's, there's five major factors that I look at. One is what, what the home is priced for. That is a factor. While that's not the final determining price, it is a factor for what it would sell for. Um, the local market conditions, what's going on in the market, are prices going up and going down, how much inventory is out there, um, and what are you competing with, um, the locations certainly, and factoring in all of the, the aspects that go along with that, and then uh, the condition. So one of the things that we talk to our sellers about is, hey, these are the things that are going to affect the sale of your home, uh, price, location, condition, market conditions and competition, right? We can control two of those things. 
We can control the condition and we can control the price. And so this also in advising them helps them understand that you are here to advise them on what to do, not to tell them this is what you have to do because there are certain things that are outside of our control that we can't, we can't you know, control for that matter. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna look at um, some, some comps and we are going to uh, look at a home that's for sale. It's actually for sale right now and look at what are some of the things that would affect what the value of this home is. And so I'm gonna hand out this listing first. Um, Tim, can you run down that list one more time a little slower? Sure. Five it's uh, price, yeah. um, uh, thank you. Price, condition, location, uh, market conditions, and competition. So market conditions are two, and con competition are similar, but two different things. First is, what is the market doing? Is it going up or going down, just in general? Then the other one is, within your specific area, what's the competition for your home? Because, you know, the, the old real estate adage is it's location, location, location. You can have a market that's flying up, and there's nothing for sale except for in this one community and there's 30 houses for sale. So the prices might be going down in that, that particular neighborhood, but everybody else is going up. And that really is what creates the value of you as a realtor is bringing that knowledge and that expertise to the, the client and being like, listen, I know you're reading in the USA Today and the Washington Post that prices are going crazy, but I'm telling you there's 30 prices, houses for sale in this neighborhood. You can actually lowball this one. Or I know you've heard that the market's flattening, but there hasn't been a, a home for sale in this community in two years, and it's very desirable, and there's 10 people that have written an offer. So if you want to write an offer, you can't even start at asking. You've got to be $20,000 higher, right? So, so these are the, the things that we're bringing to the table as an expert advisor. I tell people when I sit down with them um, that my job is not sales. Well, I mean, I'm a real estate salesperson, but my job is not to sell you anything. It's to advise you on the pros and cons of this home by comparison to others and your needs to figure out, is this the right one for you? And what do you need to do to get into this home if you determine that it is the right one for you? But I'm here to help you with that process. And that takes the salesiness off of real estate. And it's like, oh, it, it, you, you don't care if I buy this home or not. Eventually, if I trust you, I'm going to buy a home with you, right? Now, when it comes to selling, it's different, right? You're trying to earn that person's trust so that you can sell their home right and so it it there are some some hard lessons that i learned through the years that i'll kind of share with you but when you're sitting down with somebody and you're saying hey um we want to figure out what the market is for your home you have to be really honest with them because you don't want to get in a situation where you've had their listing for a year and they're saying hey you told me it was going to sell for this price and turns out it doesn't, now I'm firing you, I'm gonna go find another realtor, they're gonna advise me to drop the price by $50,000, it's gonna sell in the first week, and you're out a year of time and energy and effort. So you've got this one property, okay? And let's just look at, this is in Arlington. Um, hey Shane, can you pull up the MRS? Um, so let's just talk a little, a little bit about market dynamics, right? Markets operate by the law of supply and demand, obviously. When the supply is high and the demand is down, what happens to prices? Yeah, when supply is high, demand is low, prices are going to go down. When supply is low, demand is high, prices are going to go up. Um, value is established. The value of the home is established on an agreement between a willing seller and a willing buyer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you want to, yeah. Um, so this back and forth is between what the seller wants and what the buyer's willing to pay, right? So even though the seller might want something, doesn't mean they're going to get it, right? It happens all the time. Um, so to accurately price a home to sell, you got to consistently study the conditions in your local market and the specific neighborhoods where you want to specialize. So here are the basic factors to watch for 
determining the price of a home. You've got how much is for sale, the inventory, and is that inventory rising or falling? You got the days on market. How long is it taking properties to sell, right? Things have been on the market for a really long time. It means they are poised for a price reduction. So the price should be coming down. The price per square foot. Is it, now, this is Keller Williams national material. I will tell you that price per square foot in this area is almost irrelevant because the land is worth so much. When your land is worth 80% of your value, you cannot do a dollar per square foot uh, assessment of a home. If a home is one acres versus a quarter acre, that land alone is worth twice as much as this other house, right? So you have to be very careful and you will find people coming from other areas of the country, te Texas, Florida, where it's like every house is just, what's a dollar per square foot, you know? And this is what you pay. Well, it's 3,000 square feet. It's $8 per square foot. It should be, you know, $240,000 plus $800,000 a lot. You know, now it's a million four. All right, million four. Okay, and then changes in the local landscape, monitoring the changes of major employers. That's that's your market conditions, like we talked about. Okay, so getting the facts about pricing means evaluating a given property against other comparable properties. This means comparing your clients, to, let's say, twenty-year-old three-bedroom, two-bath property in the neighborhood of similarly built homes with homes that were sold recently that match or come very close to matching the particulars of that home. So the following factors come into play when you're looking for comparable properties. You're looking for location. It should be in the same neighborhood, okay? You're looking for size. It should be roughly the same size. And you really gotta be careful in some of these neighborhoods, you'll have every single home will have this, it's the same footprint, but somebody will have blown out the back and they just doubled the size, okay? Uh, amenities, what's the, 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 you know, does it have a garage? Does it have that addition? Does it have a porch, whatever it might be? Um, condition of the home has it been updated all right so we are going to look at uh, some well yeah so this is the this is the property that I was uh, that we wrote an offer on last night uh, this is in Arlington I don't know if you can see this here but let's just look at um, how big is this property can you guys see this is there any way to zoom in? You guys probably can't see that, can you? It says 1,096, all right? Taxable living area. Now, how many square feet is it totaled would you expect? Exactly. Okay, this is really important. The taxable living area often does not include below grade square footage. All right, so the first thing I look at is how many levels is this? It's three levels. Oops, three levels, which means that that taxable square footage uh, of uh, 1,200 probably does not include that basement as square footage, yes. Great question. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, it feels like. Most of the time, if any part of the basement is below grade, they're not going to count it. Why is that? I don't know. You'd have to ask the county tax assessor of why that is. So usually in a split foyer, when you walk in in the middle and you can either go up or go down, it's going to count it. In a split level, where you, you walk in on the main level and you go down one level and up two, then it won't include that level. I, I honestly don't know. But it is one of the things you got to be really careful about when you're doing calculations of square footage. And in split levels, you have some neighborhoods where you have a three-level split, uh, three-level split, and some where you'll have a four. Well, if this one last level is below ground, it might look like the same square footage, but actually has a whole other level. And so that's a huge benefit, right? And some realtors will kind of miss this. And you're talking to your client, and they'll say, hey, it's this... I look at all the homes that have sold in this neighborhood and they're all selling for $500,000. This one's priced for five twenty-five. dollars 25 I don't think it's worth it. I'm like, you got a whole nother level on this one compared to this over here. So that's a huge benefit, right? Does that make sense? All right, so we look at it, we think roughly speaking, we probably have another, um, it's 1,200 square feet. It's a box, 1,200 by two, 600 per level. 
you had 1,800 square feet probably. So just something to think about. Does that make sense for everybody? Um, uh, can you scroll down, buddy? It was here. We, we zoomed in and then we lost it. So it, in on this sheet, it's, uh, no, it's on the front. Just flip it over again for me. Is it on the back? Okay, oh, at the top. There it is. is. Okay. Taxable living square foot. All right. So just be careful when you're looking at taxable square footage. All right. Some realtors will go in and say, uh, this is the total square footage. They'll do a real estate calculation. A lot of them are just, uh, I don't want to say too lazy because actually putting in that total square footage kind of does make you liable for that calculation. Right. So a lot of them will be like, hey, I'm not touching square footage. Whatever the MLS pulls in based on the tax record is what I'm going to advertise. We we have taken to going back in and actually taking measuring tapes and measuring the property if the ta taxable square footage is under uh, reported because we want people to see the higher number. Right. We don't want that to be a secret if we represent the seller. Now, if we represent the buyer, then we're going to argue, well, it's less square footage, even if it's mismarked because we want to get a lower price. Right. But just be careful about that. Okay. Um, scroll up to the top, Shane. Um, down. Yeah, I'm looking for days on market. I think it's down. Oh, we'll look at the sheet. All right. So, are there any, you guys, are there uh, extras? Do I have one? Okay. Okay. I got it. All right. All right. So, this is a full listing. You guys seen this before? Have you looked at these? Okay. So let's just look at some of the things. This is all going to be online too, but uh, we're going to go back to the second page in the back. Um, see what this total square finish? Zero. Up at the top left, total square feet finished. Zero. So the realtor didn't put anything in. Okay. Above grade finished versus unfinished, didn't put anything in. Below grade finished, unfinished, the realtor didn't put anything in. When you get new construction, They'll be better about this. Like homes built in the last 10 years, they'll probably actually have these numbers in the tax record. But all homes that were built, this home was built in 1947. We're just not going to have this in the tax record. So you're going to you're going to have to not guess, but you, you won't factor it into the equation as much. All right. And then um, let's look down lot lot square footage 7154 when you deal with fairfax county arlington county this is in the kind of exterior section on the right side total acreage 0.16 you see that that's a big factor all right what's the size of this lot you're in arlington this lot is worth seven hundred thousand dollars right you tear this house down put a new house up um so the, the size of it is certainly a factor um, but when we're looking at comparables, we're going to make sure we want to compare similar lots sizes. Okay. Um, last factor we talked about days on market. So on page three, looking at the bottom, uh, you see days on market MLS, days on market property. What's it say? One, this thing just came on the market. Okay. All right. So this We've, we've been working with a client who's been looking at Arlington like three or four months. They're not really ready to buy, but they're kind of getting ready. And then they see this coming soon sign. They've been asking me, hey, I've seen this coming soon sign. I've been looking on the MLS. There is a coming soon status where you can, as a realtor, put something in that said this is going to come up. It wasn't listed to coming soon. Um, it just so happened that they had sent me it Friday night. I didn't look at it on Saturday morning. I actually looked at it and saw that it was active. So I lucked out because if I looked Friday night and I said it wasn't there, I might not have looked again until today and I might've missed it completely. Looked on Saturday, I said, it just came up, open house tomorrow, go take a look at it. And uh, they saw it, they liked it. The fact that it was put up on a Friday night, no, no, it was put on a Saturday. I looked Saturday morning. It was put on a Saturday, there was an open house on Sunday means that most of the people that had searches set up to um, to see property probably didn't see it when they went to work on Friday when they're looking at their email, right? So maybe they got the response, the email on Saturday that said, hey, this property just came up. But 
I don't know that they were able to adjust their schedule enough to see the open house on Sunday or set up a time with their realtor over the weekend, right? So when I'm doing a listing, I'm usually putting a market, a property up in the market on Wednesday or Thursday so that all those searches set up, they're going to see it on Thursday, Friday to be able to set up appointments with the realtor, see it on Saturday, or at least go to the open house on Sunday. So at least the broadest amount of people who are actively looking for homes have seen it so that by the end of the open house on Sunday, we can try to get the best possible offer if it's going to jump in the first week, right? And if you wait till Saturday and people haven't seen it, now you're Sunday and you're like, I'm not sure all of the really aggressive buyers that are out there have seen this. So now do I accept that offer I got on Sunday night or do we wait a couple of days to see if there's more people that want to come? So we called the agent and they said, hey, um, my people are interested. Um, what's your plan for reviewing offers? And she came back. She said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage my clients if they get a good offer to accept it. Then she called them. She said, they want to wait till Thursday to review offers. So I called my people and I said, listen, they want to wait till Thursday. My recommendation is you write the offer tonight. You put 24 hour deadline on it. You put a really good offer together and you say, hey, listen, it's a bird in the hand. If you wait till Thursday and you don't have another offer, we may not write as good of an offer, right? Because if, if you waited a week and there's nobody else competing with us, then, then we might write it for 10,000 lower or something like that. So just timing wise, some of the nuances, I, I, think, I think Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is the best time. Now the problem with Tuesday, I'm, I'm going to leave it on myself, but the problem with Tuesday is you might get somebody who sees it Wednesday, Thursday and says, I'll write you an offer before the open house. And then even everybody hasn't really even seen it. So I think Wednesday night, Thursday is kind of a good time because you can kind of drag your feet no matter what till Sunday to the open house, right? If you ratify it, it really is a question for you. You know, like I, I think if you've got a ratified offer and you didn't change the status in the MLS and people come to it, they're going to be ticked off. They're like, why are you wasting my time? And like, I got excited about this house, you ratified it, and now you're not showing it was ratified, but it's already taken. Like, that seems misleading. And you actually have three days to change the status. That's, that's actually, whoever's listening, that's what I was told by Anthony Carr. And for the most part, everything he's told me has been true. So I don't know if that has changed, that may have changed, but legally, you won't get fined until three days, I think. So don't hold me that. Um, and some people will, will you, like, you know, an agent that's looking for buyers may say, well, I'm just going to keep it active and hopefully people will call me. Well, you're going to get some ticked off agents too that are going to be calling you like, why are you leaving this thing active? Like my clients are seeing it. They're getting excited about it. I got to call them and tell them it's not active when they're saying, I see it as active online. Why are you, why are you telling me that? You know, it just, I don't think it's good for the industry, but anyways, so days on market one, which means that if you're going to write an offer on day one, you better be pretty aggressive. Right, because you can't go and write a fifty thousand dollar low offer when, but we're dealing with listings here. So, anyways, um, all right. So, principles in selling. We gotta do the comps first. One second. All right, we don't do the CMA until later. All right. So what we would do is, and I'm not going to do this right now because you don't all have computers, but we, you want to pull the comps. We'll do this in a second, and you're going to look at what the averages are. Okay, um, Shane, can you pull up? Sorry, can you pull up my website, PearsonRealEstate.com? What what the the book is telling you to do, which is a very good thing, is <clears throat> look at what are the averages for statistics in the area where you're looking to buy. Okay. So on our website, if you go to um, resources up top, buddy, and then market statistics, and then scroll down to like Northern Virginia. Uh, well, click it now in the in the sub nav right there. Yeah. Okay. So there's a software called um, <clears throat> Smart Charts, which is a st it pulls statistics 
from MRIS, and it will give you broken down data of exactly what uh, is happening in each neighborhood. And we, and, and you pay for an advanced subscription, which you guys don't want for right now, at least, and it will allow you to make specific charts, put them on your website, and then they will update every month. So what we did was we went through all the neighborhoods or cities that we serve, we pulled all these individual charts out, we put them onto this web page so that at one glance you can look at a town and see what are the statistics for this, which if you were to do it individually, it would probably take you like 30 minutes to pull it. So you are welcome to always go to this page just for your own knowledge to see these stats. Um, and you got the different areas up here. But just let's, let's look. Let's um, Actually, you know what, Shane, can you pull on Arlington County? Arlington, because we're, we're actually doing the comps there. And let's just look and see what's going on in Arlington County. These statistics show that over the last, um, is this a pointer? Um, it shows that in the top left, Arlington County, you've got uh, 476 listings that are active. The five-year average for, for November, which is always report a month behind, and this will change, I think it changes on the 10th of the month of January, so it'll report December in like a day or two. Um, you see that we're slightly below the five-year average, right? So there's slightly less active listings than there normally are, okay? The closed listing, we're looking at 253 versus 205. So you got slightly less active, you got even more closing, right? New pendings, you're 188 to 206. You always got to be careful when you look at these stats because it looks like the dial is pinned one way or another, but you're like, oh, that's only 20. It's not that big of a deal. It's, it's like 10% or 5% for that matter. Month supply is 1.9 versus an uh, average of 2.1. Does anybody know what a level market is? How many months supply? So, so over six is definitely a buyer's market. The historical knowledge is under three is a seller's market. Three to six is normal. Over six is a buyer's market, All right? So prices are gonna be going up under three down over six and in between could be stable. I think that with the amount of information that's out there now, to be honest with you, if you and the market being so efficient, I think four is even. I think anything over four is like a buyer's market. So, you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room there, but at 1.9, what does that tell you? We are strongly in a seller's market. So prices are going up. Uh, new listings, we're at 200 versus 203, that's about average. Average days on market is 43 to 49, okay? So under 90 days, again, seller's market. Now we got month su supply. So when you look at this month's supply and you compare it to the previous month, the, it also seasonally adjusts, right? So you're going to have, in the spring, you're going to have more supply. Spring, more supply. This is each year. Spring, more supply. Spring, more supply. So sometimes you read in the USA Today, it'll be like, supply is down, you know, 20% since last month. It happens every year. So this is something that you can bring to your clients. You might listen, that's just seasonal adjustment. But when we look at the five-year average of this month over the last five years, if we're down 20% over the average for this month, now you're actually looking at real data that is useful. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. So we're looking at month supply and you're at 2%. You can see that's pretty low. It's just it's just showing you you're in a good market. Now, as you're, as you're advising a seller, you're saying, hey, listen, we can be maybe a little aggressive in our pricing because we're in a really good place right now, okay? Um, scroll down a little more. This is the average sales price over the last 10 years. How's it look? It was awesome, right? Like, if you were seeing, you, you see this right here, it was, it was like this from 2000, 2005, down to 2008. And this is the most beautiful chart you can see as a realtor. It's like slow and steady appreciating, right? I sold houses to people five years ago. If they had to sell today, they're making money. You want your clients to make money. You sold houses in 2004, and then you go back and try to sell them in 2009. You're like, I'm really sorry, uh, you owe $50,000. They're not happy with you. I didn't make you buy the house, I don't control the market, but this is an awesome, awesome chart, slow and steady up. But that also shows us that we're in a good, strong market, and, you know, you're dealing with normal stuff. 
occasionally you'll see some crazy spikes here and there. It's just something you need to adjust it as you look at market conditions. Number of active listings. Again, this kind of just shows you a reality check of over time, how are things moving by comparison to normal? Because if you just look at that month compared to the previous month, it might seem a little bit strange. And then the closed sales, you can see the spikes in the spring and then it's slower in the winter and then the days on market. Um, these are also really good charts to show clients when you sit down with them, especially buyers who are saying, hey, you know, I, just, I, I came from uh, Michigan and I'm looking for to write like offers and try to get them for 70 cents on the dollar. It's just not going to happen around here. I can show you, sir, that over the last 10 years, the average sales price in, in Arlington County has gone for somewhere between 95 to 100 percent of the sales price, averaging around 97.5. So if you're serious about buying a home, you can reasonably expect that you're going to be offering pretty close to asking price. Okay, and that includes all the homes that have been listed for 180 days and were way overpriced and had to come down by $100,000, which means that most good homes are probably selling at 100% of the sales price, if not a little bit higher. And then you've got some crazy ones that are bringing the average way down to 95%, right? Okay, so it's important for us to have a grasp of these uh, critical strategies to set the stage for using pricing criteria effectively. The strategies are standards you'll need to bear in mind as you approach pricing any property. Um, you'll uh, absorb these over time, but let's first look at um, <clears throat> there's little point in winning a listing if it doesn't sell. To get rid of a home or to sell a home for the most money for the least amount of time, it's got to be priced in the market. So there's two determining factors. We are back to the slides, buddy. Yeah. Um, so yeah. This is know what sells price principles and strategies. I uh, know yours. Okay. Um, The competitively priced properties must pre present in the best possible condition outside and inside the home. This is this is just critical in general. Um, you can buy the same sweater from the Gap, or you can buy it used from uh, uh, thrift shop or whatever. You're going to pay more for it at the Gap because it it looks new and it's in a nice package, right? It, as soon as you wear it three times, it's going to be the same sweater as it could have been at the thrift shop but people will pay the premium for something that looks really good and is positioned well, and that's part of our job in, in positioning the home. So the following, shows of graphics, uh, following graphic shows a combined selling power of the right priced home in the great property condition. And this is in your book. You're looking at it, right? It's the out of market, no man's land in the market. Price versus the comps um, and the condition. So the percentage of buyers who will look at property increases and decreases in direct proportion to the property's price compared to the market value. Pricing above the market does not get you showings. Pricing at or below the market does. So we talked about what you can and can't control, right? Important process of pri pricing to help your sellers understand is to un help them understand that agent sellers don't determine the price of their home. Instead, the market determines the price. So this is a script. Um, that was somebody read this for me under two. How many volunteers? Page 15. Go for it. Uh, Mr. Seller, some of the things you can control during the showing process are, are the condition of your property, the availability of your home for showing, and your positioning in the market. Uh, in the end, value is determined solely by what the buyer is doing in today's market based on comparing your home to others currently on the market. Uh, I don't determine value, and neither do you. The market determines value. Does it make sense? And what's the first question they're going to say? A uh, response. Uh, why are you here? <laughs> right? So they are here. They are hiring you to tell them what the price is. And they're going to work really hard to try to be like, well, tell me what to do. And we need to do that to a degree, but as much as possible, what you need to do is present them with information that helps them draw the conclusion that any reasonable person would draw so that you're not telling them you're doing it together, right? Because as soon as you've together said, based on the market conditions and the competition and the, the other comps that are out there, um, any reasonable person would assume that if I was a buyer, this is a fair market value for the home, okay? And there's a range in there that we can justify. So if you put it at the low end of the range, it probably is gonna move very quick. If you put it at the high end of the range, maybe it could sit a little bit longer. 
And if the market changes on us, so you're not saying this is what I can control. If the market changes and the market goes down, now we're going to chase it down, right? The market's moving up, then maybe we might have to be patient because it's going to rise to meet us. But I can't make your home sell today. A buyer still has to come with a check, right? So know what the seller you and you can't control. Um, so understand the window of opportunity. The best chance to sell your home is when it first comes on the market. Sellers need to be clear on this. This is important. If there's a window of opportunity that opens and closes quickly, the following graphic depicts how buyers' interest climbs rapid, rapidly when a listing hits the market and declines after the first mark. So the first few weeks are make it or break it. This is my, um, I almost do this on every listing presentation on the back of the paper somewhere, but this is how I explain it. I said, here's the market. It's like a pond and there's all these fish swimming in it, all right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can I? No. All right. I'm moving. Hold on. I'm going to break this. It's going to fall apart. It's going to be a disaster. Inside the red chairs. All right. I'll see. I broke it. I knew that was going to happen. Thanks, buddy. Okay. So these fish in the, are swimming in the pond represent buyers that are pre-qualified. They've been looking for houses for the last three to six months. They want to buy a home today. There are certain houses that are coming in that are, that are there. There are active homes on the market, but they're swimming around them. Swimming around because they think the price is too high, the condition's too bad, whatever it is. They don't like these homes. But they are ready today to buy your house. Is that me? Okay. When your house comes on the market, as soon as it hits the MLS, every single one of these buyers that have been waiting for the last three months to find a home are going to see it immediately. And they're all going to decide pretty quickly if they want to see your house. And if they don't decide in the beginning that they want to see your house or want to buy your house, when they've been pre-qualified, they're ready to write an offer today. Now you're waiting for new buyers to come into the market. They're still just kind of getting ready for the process, starting their buying, and decide that when all these other ones who've been looking for the last three months don't want your house, you're hoping that that one's going to want it. All right? So when you first put it on the MLS and it hits that market, you're going to find out real quick what the response is. It's just with listings online, everybody sees the photos immediately. You're going to know what the response is. So that's really our opportunity in that first week. Make sense? That's why also after that, that interest declines very quickly because after that, you're waiting for, for new people to come in. Now, if you go in and your house is, it doesn't pop right away, Maybe it's because the condition isn't great. People prefer that they could get something better or a better lot or whatever it is. And they're going to swim around it for a little while and say, well, I wish it was better. But if, and maybe eventually, they're like, well, it's just the best thing out there, so I guess we'll go for it. They just won't jump on it and say, this is what I've been looking for for the last three months, so I've got to pay a premium for it. Make sense? Right. It, it, it's hard, honestly. I mean, I think the best way to get feedback is be, is doing an open house yourself and seeing how people respond to it. Because you're going to actually be able to say, what do you think? And the people are going to, they're going to lie to you, but they'll be a little bit more honest. Um, when you wait till Monday and there's been 10 showings and you call realtors, you'll get 20% of them to answer the phone. And if they showed 10 properties, They'll be like, which property was that? Uh, yeah, you might get them some honest feedback or not, but if their client doesn't like it, they'll be like, I don't like it. I don't know why. It's just, they, they won't even remember. If you can even get through to the agent, right? I think now with, uh, I can do better at this. Oh, okay. It's not me. Okay. I can do better, coach. Okay. Uh, uh, what was I talking about? The feedback. I think now, if you can get them on the phone, now with the online showings, um, it's so annoying that you get these reminders for feedback that now I, for the first time in like ever, I've started just filling them out. I'm like, just stop. Because they'll send them to you like three times. I'm like, I can give them a quick feedback. So that actually is pretty good because it gives you something. You're not going to get all the feedback, but at least you'll get something. Um, so anyways. Okay, um, 
Price to reflect current market movement. Pricing requires facts and numbers, yet it's also an art. It's an art of persuasion. Choosing the right comparable properties is a big step in the right direction, but there's much more to it than that. Your job as a listing agent is to help your sellers understand how the right price impacts the marketability and sellability of their home. Marketability and sellability are determined on the following, market direction, market speed of change. All right, so don't, that, that's really going back to the statistics that we were looking at already. We kind of covered that. Don't chase the market price ahead of it. Your ability to be knowledgeable of the current market pays off when it comes to any kind of shifting market, whether up or down. So in a rising market, seller who feels their home is on the side, is who feels time is on their side, might price it above the current market and hope that the market will catch up and bring them to the price that they want. Provided the market continues to rise, sellers who want to cash in on improving prices in rising markets are still well advised to price at a market to get a sale now and move on with their lives. All right, so you see that there's no guarantees that that market's going to continue to rise, right? Especially if you're moving into seasonal adjustment, like, hey, it's been going up, but we're about to hit August and you're about to come on the market. This could just, this could fall off. The demand could fall off very quickly, all right? When prices are falling, sellers make a huge mistake by pricing too high, hoping to attract the offer they want and thinking they will drop the price later if the strategy doesn't work. The reality is that most sellers who do this never correct enough to keep up with the price reality. Sellers whose price rise will get the buyers while the listings, uh, while the listing that's chasing the market down will take longer to sell. All right. So this is where we come in as trusted advisors. Pricing right is hard work, but it's worth it because it gets your sellers to their goals and you make money for your business. Professional honesty is your best approach. It, may, it means understanding where the customers are coming from and being professional enough to stand up for them and tell them truth about the tough topics, such as market conditions, pricing and property, buyer and buyer agent feedback, comparable uh, sales. So here's a short script to address pricing honestly. Who wants to read it? Go for it. Do you want me to tell you the truth or do you want me to tell you what's right here? Mm. Mm. Do you have a listing agreement yet? That's the question, right? If the seller insists on a higher than market price, get an agreement now that if you have not had a bona fide offer in a reasonable short period of time, you will reduce the price to your recommended price. So I'll just read this one. The first few weeks of your home, your home is on the market are the most critical and will attract the most serious buyers. If we don't get a bona fide offer in this time, the market is telling us the home is overpriced. If after three weeks, this is what's happening, do you agree to, agree to reduce the price to my recommended price to meet market demands? Okay. As much as possible, this is, it has been my strategy to try to get them to sign the listing agreement before you finalize a price agreement. Because you don't want them to choose you because of the price that you tell them you can sell your property for. Now, some of them might try to get you to do that. Like, what is the price that you'd sell my property for? Tell me now. I, ha I, just, I had a, just so, some, some really interesting conversations with people in the past where like, I need you to tell me right now what my house is gonna sell for. Well, as soon as you do that, if I can't sell your house for that price, I'm a liar or I'm not good at my job, right? It's just, it's difficult to do that. So again, you present the information, you say the market will determine what it will be. What I can tell you is we will position it as well as possible and market it better than anybody so that it gives your home the best chance to sell for the highest price, All right? So we're gonna um, do this little exercise, all right? We're gonna put the essence of critical pricing strategies below in your own hands, take no more than one minute of explanation per point, challenge yourself to communicate the basic idea and refer to the preceding pages as needed. Um, so pair up in twos and do this uh, exercise just to explain these things. If anybody has questions, feel free to ask.
Yeah, so just as a reminder, you're, you're just writing a, like a sentence or two about what each of these things mean to make sure that you have full understanding. And then um, uh, we'll, we'll move on in like one minute, just, just for discussion for you guys. Right. So, right. If prices are going down specifically, yeah. So some people, some people will come with the mindset that this is what I want for my home. Let's say I think the market's 500. I'll take 500. So I'll price it at 520. And you, because I, I, I think I'm going to get a low offer and I want to get 500. Well, the reality is, if other homes are priced for 500, and you come in at 520. That makes this house look better, right? So now we're going to swim around. And if the prices are going down, you might need to get to 490 before you become attractive. So your best chance to get the best offer is as soon as you come in the market being the most attractive home, not being at a price point where you think, well, if they write me a low offer, I'll be the most attractive. If you come on the market especially, you know, I tell my buyers, something just came on the market. We can't lowball them, Right? Because if you actually want the house and you write a low offer on day one, you're going to offend them, right? And they're going to say, well, if anybody's higher, I'm going to take them just out of spite to you. Now, once it's been on the market for 30 days, they're going to be more flexible, right? But when they are first come on the market, the seller has the leverage, right? So. What if it's like, um, like you have to move right away? Like, you find that. I've, I found I find that homeowners are rarely desperate, right? Such that they will take much less than they should be able to get because of moving conditions, right? So how much is your mortgage a month? Let's say three, four thousand dollars a month. Are you going to take twenty thousand dollars less because you want to move it today, or are you willing to wait a month or two to get twenty thousand dollars more, right? Now some people can't carry both. But um, that's usually around here, not the biggest pressure point. Now, the first thing that you do as you're representing buyers is you call the agent. Say, hey, I've got somebody who's interested. You don't say they're desperate for the home and you don't make it seem like they would be doing you a favor to write an offer. You just say, hey, I've got somebody who's interested. Can you, what can you tell me about the circumstances that I can relate to my buyer so we can try to make this work, right? So the best thing that you can do and the thing I love about Keller Williams is their mentality is win-win. Right, we want to create a win-win for everybody. Um, and I was at a brokerage before this, and it, it, you know, it was like, what's in it for me, right? So you want to create a good relationship with the other agent. You want it to be a good situation for the seller, and you want it to be a good situation for the buyer, right? We're just looking for a fair market. Um, and if you find out, and they sell you, hey, listen, my guy is desperate. He needs to sell today. You know, right? But you can't assume that, right? Because if there's 10 offers on the table and you think that they're desperate and you're wrong, you're just going to lose, right? Well, so <clears throat> you, you would think that that would be true. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't, right? The, Yeah. Well, you also, here's the, here's the interesting thing about real estate. 15% of real estate do 85% of the business. Right? So there's a few people that do the vast majority of real estate. And then there's a ton of people who like to talk. Right? And they think they know everything, but they sell like a house a year. But they want to feel important. Right? <laughs> so they'll just talk. Like I've been in, oh, uh, never mind. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, that's right. Which is why, as the buyer's agent, you always ask, right? Hey, listing agent, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, tell me everything. I mean, I'm I'm your best friend. I want to hear all of the secrets so I can help my buyer. But you know, you're always going to ask, what's the situation with the seller? They might not tell you. But I'll, I'll, sometimes 
the, the objective, the, the job of the listing agent is to, and the buyer's agent for that matter, is to represent the best interest of the client. It may be in the client's best interest for you to tell somebody anything that will motivate them to write an offer. Now, you don't want to lie, but sometimes it's like they're desperate to get me an offer because I know I've got somebody that's on the fence that's about to write an offer, and as soon as you write an offer, I know that one's going to write an offer. So now you're getting played, right? That, that lies on the ethical line too, right? But I've been in a situation with a seller where I know I've got an offer. That's not good. I know that offer is willing to go higher, but I can't make them go higher. And somebody else comes in and says, I've got somebody who's interested. Write an offer. Write it at whatever you want to write it. Because I, I honestly don't even care what it comes in. I know that when you write an offer, I'm going to get this one higher. And I represent the best interest of my seller. I'm not going to be unethical. I'm going to say just write an offer because I want that offer because it's going to help me get that one higher. Now, if you're higher too, great. As you can, right. Right, but in that case, does it, does it, does it, is it unethical for me to make you, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to say that seller's desperate because that is misleading, right? But whatever I've got to say to get you to write an offer that's not misleading, um, you know, is, is possible for me to represent the best interest of the seller. Or maybe not saying it, maybe not saying it, right? And that's one of the things in the listing agreement that you'll say to the seller, do I have the permission to tell other buyers that I have an offer? And I've actually, I've gone back and made sellers change that and initial it so that I either do or don't because it would represent their best interest, but I'm not going to not do the, what they agreed to in the paperwork. Like sometimes I know this, this, client that's coming in, the buyer says, listen, I'll write an offer, but I am not going to compete. And so I got to go back to the seller and be like, I need you to tell me I don't have permission to tell them if there's other offers. And so when they ask, do you have other offers? I can say, I can't tell you that. The listing agreement says that I can't say that. Right? So the, the, the real estate thing is interesting, right? Because you see HDTV and you're like, there's, you know, I can show people houses and I can write an offer. Like, I'm sure I can figure that out. But there, there's a lot that goes into representing the best interests of a buyer and seller. And you have a huge fiduciary responsibility, which is representing the best interests of their financial well-being in this transaction. So just, just be really careful with what you do. Don't do anything unethical, illegal, immoral. It just will not. You think you get your client like an extra 10 grand by shading the truth a little bit. Just not, not worth it. You lose your license. Okay. Now we're going to go to a CMA. How are we actually going to determine the price for these properties? I am going to show you briefly how I would do this. And I'm going to give you these sheets and I want you to not look at them. Um, in this case, I'm going to drive there. Is that cool? So the first thing I would do would be to go in and find the subject property, save the listing, and save the full listing and tax record for that property. One second. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. All right, we're just changing it to the screen view for those people online. Are we recording this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are just switching the screens for the online people. All right, so if you have a computer, pull up the MLS. I think it would be good for you to just kind of go through this with us. Pull up the subject property in the MLS. Can you zoom in on the screen? 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see, we just do that. Okay. If you're online, we're apparently having some problems with screen sharing. So, um, of the actual computer screen, we're going to try to zoom in on the screen so you can see it online. But I'm going to proceed with looking at this property. Okay. I'm going to save this full listing and tax record by going to by selecting the property, doing print. You know, print full listing tax record, print the PDF. It's going to show up as a PDF. I'm just going to save it on my desktop. And the reason for that is I'm going to reference data about this that I'm going to need down the road. So I'm going to save it. I'm just going to save it on my desktop. If, if this were me and I was representing the seller, I would create a folder for the seller and put their name on it and all that kind of stuff. But obviously, just for now, I'm just going to save this here. So I'll keep this up as we go. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the listing address and I'm going to go back to search. Now I'm trying to find comparable homes in a similar neighborhood. I'm going to try to find active under contract and sold homes. So I'm going to take this active contract coming soon and sold. I don't want expired. I don't want withdrawals. Because right now I'm just trying to figure out what is actually going on. Expireds and withdrawn said these people tried and it didn't work. So what difference does it make? Now, it is interesting to go back and look at expireds and withdrawns and said, hey, these people tried and it didn't work at this price. So why would we think that we would do better than them? But what you really want is the data of what actually did work, what sold, what's under contract. And what are we competing with right now? So I'm going to change those statuses. In this case, I know uh, the address. So I'm going to go in. I'm going to put the address in here. Control paste. I had saved it. I'm going to put this stuff down here. And it's going to take me to the subject property neighborhood. It's in Arlington. All right. I've got a lot of houses in this neighborhood. It says my house is in. Uh, well, I'm going to go back and look at it. Where was it? I'm going to pull up my PDF. Oh, dear. It's it, in Leeway Heights. Why is that? I don't know. It just is. Leeway Heights. Okay. But certainly Westover area. So I'm going to look at um, what's Leeway Heights. It's hard to figure it out in here, right? So there's Leeway. I don't know exactly what that means. All right. For starters, I'm just going to pull a search around this property let's go out mm, let's go out a third of a mile okay let's look at my results i've got 500 plus results why is that why are there so many properties showing up because i'm showing all of history oh well, let's pull it only to ones that were listed in the last day last year 365 days okay you'll see that this number will change oh, i went from 500 to 32 that's where we want to start we only want to show stuff that happened recently, right? Now, I'm going to look at the results here, and I'm going to see I got that looks somewhat similar. That's not similar. I don't know what that is. This is somewhat similar. It looks like I have an addition. Basically, what I'm going to try to do is find properties that are the same model as this, okay? I'm going to go in and say, uh, this is somewhat similar but has three windows. All these are different. This is similar, but it has three windows across. So we know that that one's bigger because it's got three windows. What's that? Uh, uh, listing agent summary. Yeah, there's different ways to view these properties. A gallery agent. So if you're in a full agent, you're only going to see one at a time. Right now, as I start my comps, I'm going to start at agent, uh, gallery agent because it's just going to allow me to see the basic front picture. All right. Um, let me see what else I can see here. I'm just trying to get ones that are similar. Mm -mm -mm. These are one level. Oh, that's similar, but does it mine have three windows across the top? No. So it's not exactly the same model. Mm. Oh, there we go. That's one. That's one.
That's one with an addition off the side, which is why it's at 915. My subject property is at six something. There's one at 525. That's exactly the same. Oh, but it's got an addition. It's at 825. Why is that? It's got an addition off the back. I'll put it in for right now. Mm. This is why you're supposed to have an exterior photo for your front listing. Um, you can't see exactly what it is easily. Uh, there's the album. Let's see if you can see the whole album. There's the front. No picture of the exterior general. Great. Thank you for coming. Well, it is there, though. That's the thing that's weird. So, but that looks like a similar property, so I'm just going to throw it in there. Uh, in the beginning, I'm just trying to get a bunch of properties that are similar, and that's the subject property. I'm going to take all these properties, and I'm going to put them in a cart. All right. So, I'm going to take, I, you can create a cart. Well, the cart is automatically created for every person, uh, client that you put into your MLIS. Okay. So I'm just going to put it in seller care right now and I'm going to put add to, and it's going to create a cart with nine properties in it. Just to quickly go over this, I'm not going to do it all, but um, if you were to add a client, you can go to my matrix contacts and I can go down to the bottom and add a new client. I put the name, last name, email address in there. Now, when I go to my carts, and I'm just going to find it because I know I can get to it this way. I can see all of the carts at the bottom. Scroll down. You see these carts? There's a cart for every single client. All right. Sometimes I'll create a cart and see if I got an example in here. Problem is you got to go clean them out, and I haven't cleaned them out. Obviously, you can see because there's like thousands, tons of them in there. Sometimes I'll create a cart for Baines and then Baines this week because I want the properties that they've seen over time versus the ones I'm going to show them this weekend. Um, and then I created a couple of generic ones, cart two, three, four, five, six, so that if I'm quick ever just running through and I need to do some stuff, I can just throw it in there and not have to worry about creating a client for it. I just need to store some stuff as I'm searching around for properties. I made a cart, yeah, two, three, four, five, six, and then I just put my email address in there. Um, so this was this was Mackie on his sale, and this was Mackie. I had to create Mackie purchase so I could have two different cards for him because I was working with him to sell his property and buy another one. Um, and it, you can clear these out. I just haven't done it recently. All right, so I'm going to go back. I had all these in my seller. Uh, is it here? No, it was in my buy, my seller cart, and now they're not showing. This is the other thing about MIS, which can be annoying, is sometimes it doesn't sync up immediately. So it showed a zero, but there actually were nine in there because I had just put them in there. All right. Now, I'm going to go back, 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 because I'm going to try to find my original criteria, which I now have lost because I've like searched MLS three times since here. All right, hold on a second. See if I can save it. I got there. Okay, so I actually were able to back up into my search. I got nine properties that are similar. Um, I'm going to just for my sake. I want three level properties. I don't want two levels, um, and I want detached. That brings me down to 26, and I'm going to expand it just a little bit more. because this neighborhood here actually goes up to here and around there. Sometimes if you're trying to figure out what similar properties are, uh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, you can zoom in and kind of see what the neighborhood looks like. You can also look at school districts and see where the boundary lines are for school districts. Um, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go up to Lee Highway and I'm gonna come down here because I know this is kind of more a part of this neighborhood. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna refine uh, go back to my criteria, and I'm going to look for properties that were just, I mean, this house is is 754 So I'm going to bracket my price points because I know that it's not more than $100,000 overpriced. And I'm going to go and say I want everything from 650 
to 850. All right, now I'm zeroing in on what actually will likely be the comps for this property, right? It doesn't matter if something sold for $950,000 or something with that property that makes it different enough that it's not really a comp for this property. If you're dealing at a $2 million price point, then you might do a $300,000 range or $500,000 range. But when you're dealing with 750, you're going to be within 100. So I'm going to go back and look at these now and see if I find any more. We did that one already. I think we did this one already. I'm not sure if we did this one. I'll click it. That's one. This is one. This is definitely one. That's one for sure. And that's the comp. All right, so let me go back to my card. I'm going to add these guys in here. Seller, add two. I'm going to view them. Now I've got my 12 properties. Okay. Now, if I couldn't find any properties, I would expand my criteria. I would go further out. I would be more flexible. But if I can find 12 properties that are relatively similar within a third of a mile, price point wise, you're really starting to get close to finding real comparable properties. You go into a neighborhood of townhouses, you'll find the exact same house, you know, five of them within the same block. And you can, know, you know exactly what the comps are. Arlington's harder because these houses are old. And let's just even look within here. I've got 670, I've got 750, 775, 765, 890. What's going on there? So you start looking at the pictures and say, okay, well, uh, it's got an addition off the back. Boom. All right. I'm going to take that one out. It's that much. It's so far off our price. And now it has an addition that it's not really a comp, right? This one at 525. This is interesting. Let's take a look at what we got here. Oh, it's a, du it's a duplex. All right. That's not a comp. I'm going to take that out. This at 870, why is that at 870? Oh, it's got an addition off the back, all right? Now, I would be going through the, and I did this because I just did these last night. I would be going through these and looking at them more carefully and saying, okay, what is the comp, yada, yada. I got 725. Now, my subject, again, was at what? That was at 750. It was a similar style. I'm going to look at this. All right. This is the exact same floor plan, I can tell you. Uh, it's old cabinets, old countertops. So mine's at 750. This is at uh, 745. This is at 725 and isn't as updated. Now, I didn't show you the listing of the active property yet, which I can do, but I can tell you that the kitchen's more updated. The lot's flat and square. And this is just an older. So you got 725 versus 750. This is a really good comp for that house. Okay, so we're going to definitely keep that one. This one's at 715. Uh, and when I look at it, I'm going to see a horrible kitchen. Cute house, $715,000. All right, grandma's furniture. Uh, she probably lived there for a long time. Probably didn't update the finishes as much, like the kitchens and bathrooms. Oh, wow, look at that. That's a feature. We call that a feature. Hey, I told you it was coming. I don't know why I got that right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It probably smells like cigarettes. Um, okay, so you see it's 715, all right? And then I'm going to, uh, this is for rent, so that doesn't matter. And so when I pulled my search, what I should have done, I'm going to remove these checks. When I go back to my, I can't go back to my criteria now because I'm out of it, but you can say, uh, actually, that was from my initial search where I didn't put a price bracket in. And I was just looking at listings. So I almost always do $100,000 or more just to take out the rentals. And then you'll know that in your price point, you've only got things that are for sale. Um, but now I'm down to eight, all right? And so I would look at these, some of these more, um, 745, 699, 725, 784, 765, 735, 709. Now these are the listing prices, right? Then I would look at the sold prices. Well, then I would take these, look at the pictures to make sure I'm really informed about what they are, 
I would do a little bit more research to make sure that I'm really comfortable that these are comparables because I've been in that property and I've seen it and everything's good. And then I would say, it says screen sharing is now paused. Okay. Um, and then I would, I'm going to take all these properties, I'm going to select them all. Check all. And I'm going to go down here and I'm going to create this fancy button, actions, CMA. Okay. I'm going to name the CMA. Personally, I name it by the address. I always name it street, 16th. Oops. 16th. Uh, what was it? 16th, 5725. 5725 CMA. If you name it here and you select who it's a part of, and I'm just going to, this is in my cart, so I'm just going to make it a part of me. Um, when you save it, it'll, it'll save the CMA for reference later on. Okay. And then I'm going to go to the pages that I want. There's a variety of pages in here that you can use, and they have all sorts of different things. I encourage you to look at them. What I am looking for most consistently is the price analysis with photo, which is what you're looking at in front of you. That's the piece of paper. Okay. You can also do um, a, a good one is the market statistics. Where is that? Pricing. No. There's more in here. Oh, there they are. Statistics. That's an interesting one. We'll look at that too. All right. Then I'm going to go to the subject and I'm going to put in the actual subject property that I want, which is again, why I keep this open because I know I'm going to need this again. Hey, you are the most annoying thing ever. Okay. Mama. Okay. I'm going to take that. I'm going to fill that in. That's going to populate the one on the left. You always have the subject property on the left side of every page, which is nice when you're looking at it, there it is. Then I'm going to look at my cover sheet and I'm going to put my contact information in there. You can update a logo, which looks really nice when you're presenting this to people. Um, I did not actually print a cover sheet for you, so you don't see it. And then I'm going to select my comparables. Now, one thing I'm not going to do is put the subject property, which is, was in my cart in the comparable. So I'm going to remove that and say, okay. And then I'm going to basically keep the rest. If I decided I would, I'll select them all. This will allow you to make adjustments. Okay. So you can actually go in here and change, uh, adjust things price wise for different things. Let's look at like this bedroom was actually five bedrooms. I don't know why, or, or you'll find this a lot. Somebody will say it's four bedrooms and it's actually three bedrooms because one of the bedrooms doesn't have a legal window, uh, but they're calling it a four bedroom anyways, and then they say in their disclosures, oh, that technically this isn't a four bedroom, which is annoying, but it is what it is. So you can adjust this stuff to show what it actually is, okay? When you're actually pulling the comps. Um, let's see if I, if I do this. I don't often mess with this stuff because uh, it's more of a conversation piece, but let's just do that, for example. Um, and then I'll go back up and I'm going to click finish. I'm going to click save because now it's saved in my search and I'm going to click view CMA and it's going to create something that's pretty similar to what you look at. I think there's a couple extra properties in here that actually weren't in the ones that I put on uh, the one that you have. All right. And it's going to create this really nice format. So you can look at and compare apples to apples. How many levels? What are the bedrooms? What are the baths? Uh, what's the list price? And then what's the closed price? Okay. What was the seller subsidy? So does anybody know what a seller subsidy is? Buyer assistance. Right. So a buyer, a closing cost for a buyer, in addition to their down payment, is going to be typically between 2 and 3% of the sales price is what they're going to have to bring in addition to their down payment. That's typically to cover uh, basically sales tax because as a buyer, they don't pay you, you get paid by the seller. Um, it's to pay for the settlement fees, the attorneys, the lender fees, all that stuff. So 
if there was a seller subsidy, you would take whatever amount is in here and you would subtract it from the close price and that would give you the net sales price, which is actually what you're comparing apples to apples with what your property is. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, so we see these. Now, why don't any of these have seller subsidies, you think? That's right. They sold in six days, 11 days, five days. Is a seller going to give a subsidy if they don't have to? Heck no. Now, this one sold in 40 days. I have a $10,000 seller subsidy. This is kind of illustrating the point of when you first go on the market, you have the strongest leverage. You go on the market, you've been on the market for 30 days, you're going to get a lower price. This was on for $784, sold at $775, had $10,000 subsidy. Right? Now, this sheet that you're looking at starts the conversation. Let's really look at these properties. Which ones are the most comparable? Correct. What shows you that they're the exact same model? Pictures and square footage, right? So you look at the total taxable living area on the back, on, on the first page, you see ours is 1196. The next one is what? 1304, then 1344, then 17, 1176, okay? So these first two, as we can see, because they have different windows across the top. We know it's not the exact same model. We go in the back. We see these things are dead center, exactly like ours. But what else do we know about these properties from looking at the pictures? Grandma's kitchen, right? It hasn't been updated. Now, I actually didn't show you the subject property yet, but I'm just telling you it's in better shape than those. Um, so when we look at this, I've got one listed 754. It's been one day on the market. It has newer kitchens, better condition. It's been painted. The hardwoods are in good shape. So now you're getting into this point of what's the price difference? Is it worth it? Right? It's one day on the market. Can I write them an offer at 725? No, I'm going to, I'm going to upset them. Do I think other people would be willing to pay 745 for this house? I, I personally do. Because when I look at all the homes that are actively for sale, when I pulled everything, how many did we see in this price point? I didn't see any actives that were within 650 that were compa com comparable. So there's not a lot of inventory out there. So you, Mr. Buyer, if you want to write an offer on this property and you want the house, you've got to give them what they're asking. Or we can wait a week and we can see if there's any other offers. And if there's no offers, maybe we can go in lower. But if there's three other offers, you lost the house, we keep looking, right? And in a market like this, it's not uncommon for buyers to have to lose a few properties before they really understand how competitive the market is and understand what is necessary to do in order to win the property, okay? Now, these are, these are for competitively priced properties. Um, there are still plenty of properties out there that you'll see that, that will sit on the market for a long time and they just need to be reduced in price, right? But the good ones are going to go quick. And so if you're representing buyers and you have them on an MLS search and they're getting listings out there sent to them regularly and a house comes on the market and it looks really good, you can't wait. You got to move quick. Okay. Um, but for my seller, if I'm, if I'm looking at this and I'm actually representing her, I would say, well, we've got one seven twenty five, we've got one seven fifteen, just like yours that's sold. Um, yours is in better condition. What do we know about the market? It's hot for sellers. There's nothing else for sale like yours. Let's give it a shot higher. What do we got to lose? Right? And so she puts it on 754. And we're off to the races. Does that make sense? So, two weeks, worst case scenario, it has nothing to happen. Right. How much are you over? It's a weird question. So, um, let's say this house wasn't, so it's on at 754. When you set up a search for homes for sale, how would you set it up for a buyer? Like what are the big criteria that you're looking for? Okay. Right. 
So she set it up $4,000 above a huge price break where searches are just going to stop looking at 750. As soon as she drops it by 4,000, you're actually going to introduce that home into a whole new market of people who have set up searches between, let's say 650 to 750 or seven to 750. So personally, I would at least get it below 750. I mean, you're probably looking at needing to get it to, to 10,000. I mean, at 750, dropping a price by 4,000 doesn't mean anything, except for in this situation, it means you get it to 750. So I, I might try that. But you're going to know, like she had 15 people through the open house yesterday. It went on the market on Saturday, and she had 15 people on Sunday. So she's in pretty good shape. It's a weird price. What's that? It's a weird price. I mean, why would you price it at 754? It is a weird price. It is a weird price. Yeah. Now, as a seller, how much does a new kitchen cost? Right. And you paid, I paid $5,000 to paint it. I had paid $5,000 for my new floors. I got a new HVAC. I want to recoup all that cost. As an agent, you're saying, I understand. That's not necessarily what you get to do. But as a seller, they're saying, well, I want it because I think I can get it. Well, we can give it a shot. You know. But here's what I'm telling you is that I can't guarantee your house is going to sell for this. And if it doesn't, then we're going to need to do a price adjustment within two or three weeks. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the circumstances of the seller. Like, what is their, yeah, and what are their circumstances? I mean, some of them are like, as soon as I get to a certain price, I go underwater and I can't afford to bring money to the market, uh, the table, so I have to do that. Some people are like, I've lived here for 30 years. If it doesn't sell this year, I don't care. You know, I'll sell it next year. Um, most people are are relatively realistic and I think that that's part of our job when we represent sellers is to figure out what is your motivation what are you willing to do so you make sure you want to step into this relationship too I mean you start with a seller who's like a really nice person but saying hey you know I, I know my house is worth 750 but I'm not selling it for less than 850 just, just say I wish you the best like I truly wish you the best because they're going to go with some somebody will take it for 850 Somebody will take it for 850 and if you've been honest with them and told them this is what you need to do and they see you as the professional, a year later, they'll be like, now I actually really do need to sell it. You were honest and you told me what was going to be happening in the first place, and it, but, you know, what was truthful anyway. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll work with you now. Does that make sense? So, a lot of people get very emotional about their house. Yeah. They're to to sell. How, do you, how do you deal with them kind of getting their emotions out of the price decision? Right, so yeah, that is challenging. There's a couple of, uh, I think there's even some scripts in here that that um, that we might look at um, in the next section. But one of the things that I will try to do is help them understand that once you agree to sell your house and you decide to sell your house, it's not yours anymore. It's somebody else's house. So what you're trying to do is prepare it for them. And do you really want to make the most amount of money for your house? we have to make it somebody else's house. So if you didn't live in this house, somebody else's house, what would you do? Well, I like my personal monkey collection, you know? Well, that's, would, would somebody else want that? You know, because now, it, so you just, you just be like, oh, it's somebody else's house. Yeah, it'd be weird if, if I walked into somebody else's house and they had this in here, right? That can work for some people and not, but, but that has been a big, um, I think, hurdle for, for people to get over that once they get over it, they say, okay, I get that. I understand it now because now my objective is to get the most money for the house. But they might say, Hey, my objective is for the next people to take that, take over this house to be to, for me to like them. And now you're like, Oh, right. Because I've got fair housing to deal with and I can't discriminate, you know? So, uh, you know, and you gotta, you gotta make them aware of that too. Um, other things about being personal is, you want to reinforce the things that you know matter to them without being dishonest. So one of the things that we'll do, we do a seller counseling interview before we actually go for the appointment. And ideally, it's best if you can have somebody else do it for you, even if it's your brother, right? Say, hey, I work with the Tim Pearson team. We've got an appointment coming for you this Friday. We're excited to serve you. 
in preparation for that, so we are the most prepared for the appointment, there's a couple things that would be helpful for us to know. Can you tell us, um, you know, what, are the, what do you feel are the best features for your home? Um, have you done any improvements to the home recently? Um, do you have an idea of what you think your home will sell for? And they're going to say, that's why I'm hiring you. And you're going to go back and say, I, no, I totally understand. We're, we're going to come prepared to discuss that. We're looking at the comps now. But if you had to do a, have a ballpark, what would you say? You're like, well, I really don't know. You're like, just take a wild guess. Hit them three times. Ask them to try to tell you in their mind what they think the range is. Don't force them to tell you. Make it like, ah, if you just had to guess, just, what do you think? Anything, you know, just do, try to get that number from them because it. I've sat down with people where I didn't have that number and, and I start the conversation and they're like, what do you think the sales price is going to be? I want to know now because we can end this meeting. And I'm like, ah, oh, crap. Well, let's go into the comps. Let me tell you, I can't control your price. Tell me what the price is. You know, and, and eventually I'm like, this person's going to be difficult to deal with, but I just go straight to it. I'm like, all right, well, if that's what it's about for you, here's this. And they're like, well, you're $200,000 off. I'm like, all right, well, it's nice to meet you. You know, save, save, save us both some time, you know. But if you can know their mindset is 900 and you know the house was 700, you don't even have to do the appointment. You're like, ah, I understand, you know. Or maybe you come in with that sensitivity and you say, you may have seen some homes that sold in your neighborhood. Um, and you ask them, why would you, why would you think that price? Why is, I know Nancy down the house street sold for, for 900. Nancy's in a center hall colonial and you're in like a one level rambler, you know? So let's look at all the homes and you can kind of guide them through that conversation. Some of the homes that have sold in your neighborhood have sold for 600, get them low, up to 1.2. Let's take a look at all these homes to really educate you on what's going on so you can guide them through that process. And at the end, you'll be like, oh, these are actually the ones that are comparable to me, right? Um, You know, I, I, I have it. I think uh, I think that's something that we could do more of. Yeah, oh, they, they occasionally will say that. So so they'll say, I, you know, Zillow says it's worth this. I don't know. I'd be like, well, how, how do you, comfortable do you feel with that? It might, seems a little bit high to me. Okay, good to know. You're not doing it to tell them what they want to hear. You're doing it to understand their mindset so that you know how to be sensitive to them when they when you have that conversation, right? Um, you know, some people come in like, oh, I, you know, Sally sold her house 20 years ago for $40,000. I hope it's worth more than that. <laughs> Do I have great news for you? You know, this, this is going to be your going to be your best friend now. You know, so I think that what you're trying to do always, um, and this is. This is by my big mantra in general. And for those of you who are off screen, I'm just going to, uh, anyway. When your expectations don't meet your reality, you experience frustration, right? I have an expectation. The reality doesn't meet it. I'm frustrated. Now, in that, I'm going to write this out because I think this is important. Ugh. This whole thing is just going to fall apart. Can we super glue these in there? Okay. I feel like a clown. <laughs> okay, there we go. It's just, I'm a visual person, so bear with me here. Um, let's just do this. Okay, so let's say your expectations in general are greater than your reality. I'm expecting more than I'm getting, okay? I'm frustrated. What can you control? Right, you connect. You can control your expectations. Or what's the other thing that you can do? Well, you're adjusting. You have one of two choices. and it is, You can change your reality. All right? Can you change your reality? Sometimes you can, right? I can change the reality. My, I can adjust the condition, right? I can do whatever, but... What we're doing in these conversations with sellers is we're trying to understand their expectations. 
when I'm going to go there, I'm going to confirm the reality, right? Because I'm trying to minimize frustration. You know, you've, you've seen uh, this is time. This is love. And this is listings, a relationship, right? In the beginning, you get that listing, man, they love you. Like, I'm so happy you're here. You're going you're gonna to make my life great. You're going to sell my house. You're going to make help me get my dreams. And over time, you're like, why is my house not selling? And love just decreases to the point at the end where they're like, who do you think you are? I hate you. Why can you not sell my house for a million dollars? Well, it's a parking space, man. I told you it was only worth $50,000. You are just like my son. He never listens. <laughs> but, but this is just something that's always in the back of my mind. I'm trying to get the expectations from this person so that I can understand. I'll, I'll determine what the reality is, but to minimize frustration. Frustration is what you're trying to Always avoid for people. Or if they say, hey, here's my expectations. I'm, you know, it's 90, I think it's going to be a million dollars, and I know it's a $700,000 house. I'm going to say, I need, I need you to reset these expectations in that meeting because I will not be able to meet your reality. I know we're headed for frustration, right? And my business is like 95% re repeat or referral business. If I can't meet, a people's, meet or exceed people's expectations, I have no business. Like, I don't do ads, I don't do phone calls, I don't do online. I just try to kick ass for people and, and help them sell great houses. So I have to, there can't be any of that. So I walk into the appointment, it starts right there. One of the things that I do in the appointment right from the beginning is I say, hey, listen, I want you to understand, I work by referral. What that means is if I can't meet or, meet or exceed your expectations, I, 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 I'm going to politely excuse myself from the relationship because I don't want you to be frustrated with me. But hopefully what that means to you is that you can trust that I'm going to be honest, right? So let's talk about what's going on in this market and let's set realistic expectations for what I can actually deliver and what the market can deliver so that we get the best possible outcome, right? And it kind of allows people to relax a little bit, says, okay, I think I can trust you now. You give me real data. You're showing me real market statistics and you seem like you know what you're doing. So, all right, let's get after it. Make sense? Okay. Um, we spent a little bit more time on the first part than we sp we'll spend on the second part. Um, if you guys want to take like a, a five-minute break, uh, grab some water, whatever it is, and then we'll get back after the second part. Any questions? Excellent. I nailed it.
right, I might be able to uh, to read this one, Shane, if I have the uh, the deal. Uh, yeah. This is the worst. It's like just messing with me. Okay. All right. Selling your listing. So you got a listing. Congratulations. You did a great listing presentation. You got the agreement. Uh, we're going to go straight to... You've done all your marketing and your handwritten notes, obviously. So we're going to skip over that. And we're going to talk about staging the property, marketing, listing, and communicating with sellers. So first, staging... The property. Uh, we talked about buying that shirt from the Gap, right? People want it to look really nice. That's going to make them pay the most for it. So um, on page 14, we see that 32% uh, of realtors report a 1% to 5% increase in an offer with staging. 16% say 6 to 10. 3% say 11 to 15. I don't think there's any question that staging your home, at least in the sense of cleaning it, minimizing it, uh, making it present well is absolutely necessary. Bringing in furniture and doing professional staging is another element. There are plenty of stagers who will come in for 200, 300 bucks and sit with your sellers and tell them what they need to get rid of, what they should stay, what should move around. In my opinion, that's money well spent. Even if you have to spend it yourself because it takes the the awkward conversation of you need to remove your monkey collection away from your relationship with the seller and puts it on that person. And if they come back and say, you know what? I can't believe the stager made me take away this monkey collection. Obviously she has no taste. Then you can walk in and be like, you know what? It's so weird. I, I agree. I think that's the, a really nice monkey collection, but you know what? Remember we talked about how we have to make it seem like it's someone else's house already. Maybe that's what she meant, right? Whereas if you walk in and you say you need to take the monkey collection down, she might just fire you. Like, how can you possibly say that to me, right? So it creates a buffer for that personal stuff that really can become emotional, like we talked about, right? So we, we definitely want to stay at home. You need to have it professionally cleaned. That's like bare minimum. Second, you need to get all your crap out of there as much as possible. It needs to be uh, minimized. And, and I have even taking sellers out to see other homes if they haven't been in the market for a while be like this is what buyers are seeing isn't this look nice this is now kind of the expectation of what a home should look like when a buyer's looking at it so if your home isn't as clean as this they're going to think something's wrong it's something wrong we don't want them to think something's wrong with the property and then want to discount it right um so Here's, so what would you say if they, let's, let's just talk about uh, somebody comes and says, I don't see why this is so important. What would you say to them? Oh, dear. I can't be trusted. Shane. Somebody, somebody says, I don't see why this is so important. What would you say to them? Um, I'm choosing you. Right. Okay. Good. Okay, a little bit nicer than that, but yeah, that's the idea. Right. 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 Absolutely. Right. That's, that's where we're driving the train, right? We're, we're driving it to that point. And we say, in order, in order for us to get the most money for your house, there's certain expectations that the buyers have. We got to do these things. Staging is going to be one of them. Right. Right. That would be awesome. That that would be harder data to get, but you can you can even go to some of the uh, the staging some of the staging websites, and they'll give you some of that. You got to be careful about how 
much they're bragging about if you hire us you'll make a hundred thousand dollars more or whatever but yeah um repairs um and i actually got this script like it kind of modified it from will but basically um what he says is and when he goes in he's like listen we're gonna i'm gonna go through the house with you and i'm gonna make a list of things that have to get fixed like these are the things that when a buyer sees it are gonna think whoa there's something wrong with this house Okay, and they're just going to take money off and they're going to take twice as much off as it would cost to fix it. Then I'm going to make a list of things that are, so those are must do's. Then I'm going to make a things of, of, of should do's. These are the things you really need to do to get it to the same level as most of the other homes that are for sale out there, right? So it gets to the standard that most homes are selling for. And then I'm going to, I'm going to make a list of could do's. And these are the things that if you do it, are going to really make it shine. It's going to make it like be the best thing out there. So you're presenting it not in a you have to do other than the must do's and the must do's are going to be things like there's a hole in the ceiling and there's water coming through it, right? That's got to get fixed. Um, so uh, they, then, then there's that uh, question, well, can we just sell it as is, right? And so um, one of the responses that they're giving you, I'll just give it to you, is, is would you prefer to pay a few hundred dollars to paint a room or do you prefer to deduct 500 to $1,000 from the sales price? Since buyers using use outstanding repairs to negotiate a lower price, it's usually in your best interest to make repairs than to have to negotiate with the buyer. Around here, you know, I think the average, with the average sales price in the U.S. being like, what is it, 300 or something like that, two I'm going to stay in one place. Um, Around here, that difference in price can be $25,000, right? So it really does make a difference for people to not have red flags. You have to remove the red flags. Okay. Next, page six, 16, marketing listing. So put your listing on buyer's radar screens. Here's your 14-step marketing plan, which you presented to your sellers in your listing consultation, which is designed to produce maximum exposure quickly and allow you to capture as many buyers as possible. All right. So we're going to read through this one at a time. We're going to take turns. Uh, we'll go, we'll go this way and then down. Okay. You start number one. Perfect. Pretty self-explanatory. Okay. And you, that's basically a walk through. You're starting to prepare it for sale. In the back, yep. Oh, um, place for sale sign for property flyers easily accessible to drive by buyers. Okay, that makes sense. You got the yard sign, and then you also have that little flyer box that so people can pull it. All right. Respond to all buyers. Okay. Important time timeliness. Okay, and I think I think that like having a separate item number five should be have a professional photographer take your pictures. I don't care how good you are at photography. Have somebody better than you take the photos. It is the most important thing to show your home well to the world. The light has to be right. Um, the the angle needs to be right. Uh, if you are not maximizing your photos, you're missing 80% of your opportunity to have the home show well. Okay. Now, when you you don't have to put every picture online. Obviously, you don't want to show closets that look messy. You got to be really careful when you're there. You should really be there with the state uh, with the photographer to take dish towels off of the the countertops and things like that because people leave them on. And a lot of photographers will just shoot whatever is there, right? Um, but this is also why it's important when you're representing a buyer to go see the property, right? Because they're only going to show you the stuff that looks the best, right? Oh, there's actually a wall missing. They just didn't shoot that angle, right? We have to add that wall in order for it to have four walls. That's a problem. Uh, I would say 200 bucks. Yeah. About right. Um, well worth it. Well worth it. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I understand when you're starting out, it's like, hey, you're starting spending money like crazy, right? I'm writing checks for everything. It's tough. You're dealing with a $15,000 commission. You know, you want to sell that house. You also want that seller, once you sell it, to tell all their friends how awesome you are. So anytime you cut a corner by comparison to what else they see, that decreases your possibility that you're going to get referrals from that person. And that is your best source of business for your future, the client that you actually have worked with. And in the beginning, you go above and beyond. You do everything that you can because you want that person to tell all your friends about it, especially if it's a personal relationship with you. And I'll tell you that chances are highest that when you work, in the, when you're getting started, it's going to be people that know you because no one's going to trust you because that doesn't know you. You have to go, you have to do twice as much work for that personal relationship as you would for somebody you don't know, because they are both looking at it as, I don't really want to work with you because I know you're new, but I'm willing to give you a shot. And you have to nail it because it's going to get to all your friends. It's going to get to everybody. And you don't want that to be, well, yeah, we did it. We worked with her because we had to, because we didn't want to have, a, I wanted to keep the friendship, but you know, she wasn't really that great or he wasn't that great. You know, that, that just is cancer for your future. So just do everything that you can to nail it in those relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't pay for the cleaner. You don't pay for the cleaner. The stager is questionable. Like, as a part of our services, we say that we have a stager that is a part of our marketing plan. We pay for them to come out, do a staging consultation. They're going to tell you what to do. And then if you want them to do actual in-house staging, bring items in um, based on her recommendations, that's your decision. And I'll kind of advise you what I think based on what she says. But um, sometimes I can say I can, I can provide you with one of those and you can do it. I recommend it. Or I can give you, you know, uh, you know, you can find some YouTube best practices. And I give people a staging list. I was like, here's, and I tell her, I was like, here's 80% of what she's going to say. She's going to tell you to clean up, have your towels looking like this, do uh, decorations in series of three, um, you know, get a couple of new towels for the bathroom, whatever it is. So I say, you, if you can do this, it's great. If you want somebody else to come in, then we can have a stager come in. You, sometimes you walk in a house and you're like, this place is perfect. It doesn't need anything. Sometimes you walk in and be like, this place should be burned to the ground, right? So what do we do? We just bring in Junk King. Um, so it really just depends. But at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, if you're competing with me, you're going to have to, right? So trying to save a few dollars, you're either going to lose the listing or they're not going to refer you. Like you kind of, this is just the standard of what you need to do in order to, to sell the home for the highest money. And that's ultimately what you're trying to promise them. Right. Did they have the same in this industry? Like, I'm sure that they have networking events. Oh, yeah. So is that where you find these vendors, or do you just get it through word of mouth, or another vendor that's had, or another realtor that's had a good? Right. So you'll, you'll see in our emails, there's constantly requests for, hey, do you know somebody who does this? I would recommend you just start grabbing those names of people that are, that are highly referred or recommended. Um, you know, I'll, I use Angie's List. I'll go on Angie's list and be like, who has a high rating for this in this area? And then I'll tell a client, and I tell this every time I make a recommendation, unless I have a personal experience with them, they, they come highly recommended. I have not worked with them personally. But if I were going to need this service, this is who I would call. Do you find that the photographers are, there's photographers that actually specialize in this? Like they're not wedding photographers oh, yeah, yeah. that double as a realtor. Yeah, absolutely. There's like, well, there's one huge company out there. I can't remember the name because we don't use them. No, that's the technology that they use. Do you know, who's the big photography company? Anyways, um, you just Google real estate photography. It'll be like the first one that pops up. And then we have a couple of small photographers that um, aren't as big, but they're a little bit more flexible. Um, you know, they've got, got 3D aerial, Matterport, um, drone photography, all that kind of stuff that, that people do different stuff, but they mostly focus on real estate. So yeah. your vendors are going to be like your photographer, your stager, your home inspector, your bum guy. Lenders, um, uh, insurance. 
settlement, construction, flooring, painters, and, and you will want to start to develop relationships with these people because you want them to know that when a referral comes from you, they got to take great care of it. Yeah. 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 Well, well, so I, 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 to be perfectly honest, answering a question, a, a real luncheon network thing, I don't know that that exists. There's uh, BNI, Business Networking International, right. which are groups that basically have chambers of commerce, um, talk to other realtors, see who they use. Um, Angie's List, you know, I, I, I actually do like going and looking at reviews online for companies. Yeah. Well, Angie's List is a little bit more fixed, but like Yelp tends to be not as fixed. But uh, Yelp is a little bit weird too because you have to pay to be on Yelp at a higher level and then, you know, Google is good. Yeah. You're not going to be able to stay on Angie's list with a really high rating if you're screwing up all the time. Right. Right. Now you can. Right. 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 Well, but you can pay to be a, a preferred person that shows up at the top, a sponsored ad. And um, you can send your clients there if you know you did a good job to say, hey, can you give me a review? So if you're only sending the clients that you know you did a good job for there, it can become a little bit skewed. So, but. Obviously, if you had, if you weren't doing a good job for anybody, no one would even give you the review. Like, I'm not even gonna do that, you know. So, um, so anyways, good photography is key, and then putting it everywhere is good. Be careful about social media. You know, you don't want to be pimping all of your listings on your personal social media page. People will start to just think, oh man, yeah, yeah, she, yeah. He or she is just, you know it feels fake, right? Because when I'm going to your personal Facebook or Instagram page, I'm doing it because I want to see what's going on with you. If everything that's going on with you is you trying to sell me something, I'm out, right? You can create a business Facebook page and then try to get people to like it and post everything on that. And then you can like what you posted on Facebook, uh, the business page for yourself or share it. But just, just be careful about that. All right. Um, you're going to post a home on your KW branded app. I think that happens automatically. Uh, six is market the home on multiple websites, including your own website, your KW, the KW site. That's that mine is a KW site. So it, it's pretty good. Um, create flyers and comment cards. The KW branded app, I think it automatically shows up on the KWLS with the way that we post it through our MLS. So I don't think you need to do anything for that. Some other places uh, around the country, you have to do that. Create flyers and comment cards for viewers of the property. Um, brochures, right? You have to have brochures, um, even if it's a one-page thing. Um, just, and, and so here's the thing about the brochures, too. The brochures are your business card to the neighbors of the home that you're selling because they're going to come in and check out the home, and they're going to see how you're marketing it. So a lot of the marketing that you're going to do for this home is going to determine what your future business will be, not necessarily make you sell that home. Yeah. Yeah. This just sold in your right. area. I, I dumped them in the trash. Sure. I mean, have you found that they work for you? Have you done them? Or do you find that your return on investment is good? So you kind of have to have an economy of scale to get to the point where you're doing that. Yeah. Right? Like, my mar uh, some of the big guys will be like, I, I spend $15,000 a month on postcards. Right? But then you have to sell five houses a month minimum to make that worthwhile. It's not going to make sense for you starting out to do anything like that. What you are working off of is relationship, right? I want you to work with me because you know I can trust me and you know that I will do the best for you because I care about you. That's worth way more than even, I know this guy's the biggest realtor in the area. Now, they might call that person too to do an appointment and compare you, but what they're gonna want to do is look you in the eye and be like, I believe you when you say that you will care for me. And I think 80% of it, that's, that's who they're gonna trust. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of them out there for sure. If you're gonna if you're gonna mail to anybody, you mail to your database first, and then I would mail to people that you know but don't know you're in real estate, right? So like my local school or my local HOA because they know me, they don't necessarily know I'm in real estate. So now I want them to see that I'm in the area. I, 
I think all of that stuff is brand awareness. The more they see your face related to real estate, the more it's top of mind. I mean, you know, and I'll just say this just so that you know, and in, in, in no way saying it means one thing or another, but so we'll sell about 70 homes a year. And again, that's like 95% by referral. I know that I may not be the first person that that, that person chooses. If they go to an open house, I know with any of my clients, they could go to an open house and if they think that house is going to sell today and their best chance is buying it with that realtor, I would not put it past any of them to say, I want to buy this house. I think I can buy it with you. Would you help me buy it? If I am not constantly reminding them that I am here to do what's in your best interest, I expect them to go somewhere else. People are always trying to get into my relationship with my clients. So I have to constantly show them, I care more about you. I'm better than them. I care more about them. I will take care of you. So Facebook ads, great. It's dripping. You're showing credibility. You're showing them that they can know, like, and trust you. No like and trust. No like and trust. Trust, trust comes in with the credibility, reminding them, oh, I've sold houses. I've sold houses. I've sold houses. I'm good in this area. Liking you because you're not constantly spamming them with, you know, pitching them on stuff, but just reinforcing at least that you're out there, you're working, you're successful. And, and it is important for you to let people know that you're successful. I mean, we send out a piece every year that's just like, hey, thank you so much. It, it comes under it positioned as a thank you. Thank you so much for making us so successful. <laughs> Here's all the ways that we're successful. But we're thanking you for helping us because we know we couldn't do this without you. But as a result, here's our ratings on Google. Here's how many houses we sold, and here's what we got over here. So they think, oh, I knew he was in real estate. I didn't realize they were doing so well. Great. Everybody wants to back a winner, right? And so you also need to be cautious. You Be genuine. But you do need to be cautious when you're when you're wearing it and you're having a terrible month. Don't go to your database and be like, man, I am having a terrible month. I am doing really bad in real estate. They're going to be like, I am not working with you. Right? Because they just don't want to work with somebody who's doing really bad. Right? So anytime you have an opportunity to genuinely, appropriately promote your successes, in a way that doesn't feel braggadocious, I think is, is good. And you can do that in whatever way is possible. All right. All right. Uh, distribute just listed notices to neighbors, encouraging them to tell family and friends about the home. Again, don't mail 10,000 people, but this is as much about letting people know that you're the listing agent, because when you have a listing in that neighborhood, all of a sudden you're the local expert. Even if somebody else has sold 10,000 homes, you're selling the most recent one. So now you have credibility. Do you know anybody looking to buy a sell in this neighborhood? Do you, are you interested in this home? Or so? I don't know, whatever. Just try to get the opportunity to talk to them and say, if you need anything, give me a call. I'm happy to help. Target the marketing to active real estate agents who specialize in selling homes in that neighborhood. Uh, okay, fine. They're going to see it in the MLS if they have a client. Um, when people send me listings, and they're like, hey, I know you've sold a house in this neighborhood, so if you have a, sell a buyer, I'd love for you to show it. My initial instinct is, we can all see the MLS. Why are, you, why, why are you spamming me, right? I understand, though, it's, it's something you can tell the sellers that you'll do. And if you do it, you've done it. And it might seem like an additional step. Fine, whatever. Go for it. Um, include your home in the company and MLS tours, allowing other agents to see that for themselves. That's the Tuesday uh, broker opens. Okay. Uh, create an open house schedule and market the, and host the open house to promote the property to prospective buyers. That's a must. Uh, at least the first weekend it goes on the market. Um, target active buyers and investors in your database who are looking for homes. If you can sell to somebody in your database, great. Provide the seller with weekly updates detailing your marketing efforts, including comments from prospective buyers and comments who visited the home. That's a must. Okay, you got to give them feedback and you got to let them know what's going on. All right. So, why don't you, who, who's previewed a home recently or been in a home that's for sale? Anyone? No one? Okay. Um, let's just off the top of our head talk about grandma's house. Okay. So, how is that, that was 715. How is that home priced according to the market comps? We'll just kind of talk through it real quick. What do you guys think? 
That was 715. This one's 745. That one we're coming on the market right now. What would you say? Okay. So that's why I'm really looking at that go. This is a project. Okay. So I'd be going to do the project, but not at this price point. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Uh, it was old, but it was it was there. I mean, it was three bedrooms. Ultimately, we already know it's sold for seven fifteen. So it depends on what you're pricing it for, right? Um. Uh. Signage. Make sure that you. Obey the homeowners association restrictions. Sherlington, Failington have some specific rules about what you can and can't do down there, so it might make sense to call the HOA. I generally, <clears throat> I generally operate under the ask for forgiveness, not permission, because if they ask you to take it down, you just take it down. But at least you got a day or two to have it off. Um, if you know that it's against the rules, obviously don't do it. But you know, HOAs aren't going to fine you money unless you keep it up there after you've been notified. Um, so is the house properly staged? What have you done differently in that house? What would you do about grandma's house? I'd get new furniture in there. Right, right. So we, we do uh, like a neutralizing. We're like, listen, here's what you would find if you went into new construction. It's going to be this color paint on the walls, this color paint on the trim, this color stain on the floor. If we can do this with your house, I have guys that I know that can come in and do it in three days. It's going to cost you ten thousand dollars, and it'll probably net you twenty-five. So I recommend we do that. Just that in and of itself can be a huge. I mean, walls and floors. When you look at a home, ninety-five percent of what your eye sees that surface area, right? So I would have got rid of grandma's furniture. I would rather have it been vacant than feel old. And then the kitchen, I probably would have just let it be. I mean, that's a twenty, twenty-five thousand dollar job to do that, right? And you're just like, well. I, I would have painted. I would have painted, and I would have tried to uh, refinish the floors. Um, and I may have. I have done this in the, in the past as well. I may have had a contractor come in there and do a design and a quote for what it would be for a new kitchen. And then I'll just put that up on the wall. Be like, hey, fifteen thousand dollars. This can be your new kitchen. So just add that on the purchase price. This one down the road sold for seven forty-five with a ten-year-old kitchen. This one on seven fifteen plus fifteen seven thirty. You're in it for with the new kitchen. You know, you're trying to basically make something happen there. Uh, what features would you emphasize on that home? Yep. Okay, location. Yep. Yeah. And, and and maybe the yard. I don't even remember what the yard looked like, but no HOA. Probably schools in Arlington. You know, highlight those. Um, Okay, this says, what buyer profile for the home would you have chosen? First time buyers, young families, large family relocating for professional reasons. How could you market to them specifically? This is a great question. How would you market to, who would you think would buy that home and how would you market to them specifically? I think that's 90%, yeah. How would you market to them? Okay. How would you actually reach them? Oh, how would I reach them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's. This is the question. Well, I know. I do. What would you do? Uh, well, I tend to do a lot of destination DC events. They're great events. And they're all people who work in D.C. Mm -hmm. A lot of go-getters. They have families. And, right. and they're fun. They're fun things. You go on the Odyssey. You go to networking, happy hours, whatever. And you just pass out your business card and start up a conversation, not talking about business, just in general. Right. What you may have in common. You have kids? Oh, great. Or, um, or if they're working in like the industry that you're in, you know, mm -hmm. past industry or whatever. Yeah. But networking to me. Uh, out there. Right. So, so here's my here's my. I'm gonna sit on the chair instead of this table so I don't fly off since these things fold weirdly. Um, people want to know that you're gonna do something different than somebody else is gonna do, right? The MLS 
is going to, am I in between the channel? I don't know, put this chair The MLS is going to send you the listing out to 400 real estate websites, right? It's going to distribute it. Everybody who's a serious buyer in that pool is going to be looking at those websites. Everybody who's a legitimate buyer for that home is going to see it once you put it into the MLS. They still want to believe that you have a magic bullet. And I've lost listings. I, I just was brutally honest with somebody recently. I was like, listen, I can tell you that I'm going to search for mommy blogs to find somebody for this particular listing or that I'm going to do this. And, 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 and I could do it. I'm telling you, it's less than 1% chance that that's actually going to do anything. But I actually lost the listing to somebody who came in and was able to convince them that they were going to, they had some sort of secret sauce to, to sell their home for more than, uh, you know, or reach an audience that I couldn't reach. So I think it is important that you have a value proposition that you can execute on whether or not you know that it's going to work at the level that they hope that it will, because to a degree, sellers want hope, right? And you're going to give them the MLS, which is what's going to be a 99% of what's going to sell their home. So you'll deliver the goods, but just be, be able to communicate some sort of value proposition. And, and so that's a great one. I do a ton of networking in DC for, for well, and you say, I'm going to be talking about your home all over the place, you know, whatever. Just, just think about it. Yeah. And if you sell a house, a listing through that, that would be amazing, first of all. But, but, but I mean, the, the, you'll find a buyer through that. Or you'll find another listing through that yeah. because it'll give you something to talk about, which is good. But again, I, I think that it's a very low probability. If anything, you're going to find a, 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 a buyer from a neighbor who knows people that want to move into the area. So this is one of the other things I would think about is as soon as you get that listing, ask them for permission to do pre-marketing and let all the neighbors know that the listing's coming on, even if it's not coming on for six months. Because I've lost two listings where I don't make people sign stuff very quickly, effectively. You know, like, oh, we'll work with you. We're going to put it on the spring. I'm like, oh, well, you know, we'll sign the paperwork when we get closer. And then a neighbor will come and be like, hey, I heard you're selling. Right. Uh, I actually want to move into a bigger house in the neighborhood. So they're just like, they bought the house. And I'm like, oh, I just lost that, you know. Well, I could have just sent a postcard out to the neighborhood and said, call me. And then I could have set it all up and it would have been a home run. You know, so anyways, here's the, here's my encouragement. And I, hopefully this is, um, this is encouraging to you in some way, shape or form. When you sell a lot of homes, it does not mean that you experience less failure. You actually experience proportionally the same amount of failure. So you're selling one house and you're like, I feel like constantly I'm having these conversations where people are working with other people. It happens to us all the time, but we just happen to sell 70 homes a year, so we just we fail a ton, right? That's okay. It, it, I, I, I just want the opportunity, and that's why I tell people that I, I work with. I just want the chance to sit down with the people that you know I can trust and show them what I can do for them, and if it's not the right relationship, I'll move on, and they'll move on, but I just need to get in front of as many people as possible. Uh, well, I try to get, I only try to do one appointment and I try to have them sign everything. So you have to, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So you hold an effective open house. Uh, that's part of your marketing strategy. Let me cover everything over here. Yeah, we did. Okay. In that open house, you're going to be talking to everybody that comes through that door. You're going to be getting them to understand what the hot key highlights of the house are. You're going to be, um, uh, um, making sure that they don't miss anything. You don't want them to feel comfortable. You don't want them to sign in so you can follow up with them. There's whole things on open houses, so I'm not going to go into that in great detail, but you definitely going to want to at least hold up an open house the first weekend it comes on the market. Yeah. Yeah. As a new agent, open houses is probably the best place for you to meet people who are looking to buy homes. You know, it is, 5% conversion rate, maybe maybe 2% conversion rate. 
of people that you will be able to convert to a client from open houses. So you got to do a lot of them. You got to learn and you got to practice. And, you know, I know that part of what they're asking you to do here is practice scripts by calling expireds and all the end withdrawns and things like that. That's just practice, right? You know, you practice, 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 practice. Eventually you'll start to find a rhythm and you'll get good at it. I don't expect when I'm calling expireds or if I were to call expireds that I would be able to convert that lead. But I would say it's a lot better practicing on an expired than it is me practicing on the client that I actually think I have a high probability of converting. Once I'd rather have it nailed by the time I talk to that person. So anyways, um, get the word out. Yeah. 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 Flesh that out a little bit. Uh, like of what you're trying to highlight? Date That's something that you yeah. should be aware of. Like yeah. All those things prior to, so you're, you're trying right. to those answers. So if you have a listing, everything that's going to go into the listing, you should know the answers for. And it's a lot of data, mm -hmm. right? You have a brochure that has most of the hot button stuff on it. It's going to be like, actually, you know, what's the acreage? I can't remember. I'll look here. Oh, it's 0.25, whatever it is. Um, yeah, there's definitely some th things that you should know. Obviously, you know, bedrooms, baths, general square footage, lot size, uh, things that dates that things have been updated. The kitchen was updated two years ago. You, really, what you want is you want in selling the home, you want to specialize the things that make this home better than the others, right? So, so a soft closed drawer still people love that, you know, like it's been, you know, oh, it's really? soft. Oh, it, it closes, look how nice that is. You highlight it in the kitchen because it means that the kitchen is a little bit nicer than the ones that were, you know, been 15 years ago and just as a feature. So, uh, I mean, I would certainly would highlight if they're new, if they're newer windows and, and if there were things that, yeah, I mean, if, if there are things that you know have a great value like that, then you can do that. Yeah. Um, you want, so what I typically do is someone comes into open house and say, hey, I'm Tim, very nice to meet you. Why don't I just give you like the 60 second overview of the home and then I'll let you walk through it yourself and feel, please feel free to ask me any questions. Here's the things that you should know about the home. It's, it's a 1920 Rambler, but they did a huge addition out the back 10 years ago. It added, it doubled the size of the pace, space. So when you're looking at it by comparison to other neighbors, you'll see that we're priced higher, but dollar per square foot, we're actually way lower, right? You take into consideration life. Um, uh, my owner is really technologically savvy. He's got Nest thermostats. These like little buzz things that you can control from your phone. They got new kitchen appliances two years ago. Um, they, they love the neighborhood because they've got kids, friends all over the place, you know, da, 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 you know, that type of stuff that just makes people feel like, oh, this is great. Now, one of the things that we do is we put these little home highlight cards up around the property that, uh, highlight things that might not be self-evident. So. The roof is five years old, especially because people are going to be coming in with their agents and the agents are going to be like, we got five minutes, walk around, see what you, see what you think. If you're like, let me know. So you highlight the, like the roof and stuff like that at that point. Uh, anywhere. I, I'll just stick them on the wall. Yeah. So I saw that in, in a lot of new construction, you know, they talk about that and then I just started doing it in ours. A lot of, very, very few people do it. I think it's a great thing to show, um, to make sure that you're showing your sellers. I'm trying to highlight these things, even if I'm not physically here to do it. Um, okay, get the word out. Uh, think of the open house as a big event. Treat it as a massive marketing campaign. Unleash your lead generation creativity. Invite people directly to your open house by actively prospecting for traffic. This is a critical lead generation activity. Doing open houses is something I think you can put on your personal uh, Facebook. Uh, you can be like, hey everybody, 
If you're in Arlington neighborhood, come on over here. I'm doing an open house at this house. Even if it's not your listing, they'll make they'll think it's your listing, right? So all of a sudden they'll be like, oh, she's successful. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, talking about, or, yeah, and, and even in that, you can say, hey, I'm doing this listing of this house. Here's some things that I just love about this house that are just so cool. It might be interesting. You know, you might want to take that down after a week or something like that if it's not your house and you're not, not your listing. But um, Gary recommends knocking out 100 homes surrounding the property because you're informing neighbors about what open house will not about the open house. You know, not only creates more traffic, but allows you to lead generate for buyers and sellers and preview the homes if they let you in. Um, be sure to include any nearby apartment complexes. In the beginning, you're just trying to get in front of people. Right, so I, if you have an open house or you have a listing, and you can have the opportunity to go and talk to people in the neighborhood, do it. You know, it, it, it seems weird walking around, but if you walk in a neighborhood and you say, "Hey, listen, I apologize for the interruption. I just want you to know, I just listed the house down the street. It's going to be on sale for five hundred seventy thousand uh, dollars. We're doing an open house weekend. I just want to invite you in case you hadn't seen it. Or, you know, I know neighbors love to to choose their neighbors. So if you know anybody that's looking to move in this neighborhood, you can put your neighbor in before somebody else can. Come on, send them over there this weekend. It's it's not going to be offensive if you, if you present it that way. It's an invitation. And it also, to a degree, will be like, uh, that that person is walking the neighborhood. They're really working hard, right? So it'll show that you've got some, some moxie. Um, Whatever's the internet, make sure it gets up on all these websites. Sometimes it takes a while for the listing to propagate to some of these other websites like Zillow, Trillion, and whatnot. So do make sure that they get up there and check it. If it doesn't get up there, you're going to have a conversation with your seller about it. So you need to kind of preempt that. Um, Twitter, okay. Community websites, great. If you can get in the HOA of that community and let them know that you've got a listing up for sale or, or anything specific to get you in there, that'd be good. Next three, communicate with your sellers. Make sure that you are actively and regularly communicating with them. That's what they're going to want to hear. You got the listing. Now they're saying, show me the goods. Give them the feedback. Let them know what's going on. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of communication tips in here on page 22. You want to uh, follow their preference for communication. Do they like phone calls, emails, text messages twice a week, whatever it might be? Um, you want to match their communication style. Do they speak fast? Do they speak slow? Do they want details? Do they want to feel good? Whatever it might be. Um, you should give them updates even if there's no information there. Uh, phone is always better than email or text for sure. Um, respond as quickly as possible to them. Uh, never talk down. Always communicate as a partner with the cu customer. And the way that I look at this is if this is the negotiation table, you want the buyer to be on the other side, not the seller, right? Not your client. It's not me versus you. It's we versus them, right? So in any of these communications, it's here's what the buyers are telling us. Buyers are telling us that the home is priced a little bit higher than they want to pay. You don't say your home is priced too high. We need to lower it because they're going to be like, says who? Says me. I don't like you. No, 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 it says the buyers. Let's put the buyers, make the buyers a bad guy, right? So you need to make sure that you're always, it's always we together. Otherwise, they're going to think it's, it's you versus them. Maintain a communication log of, of what you're communicating with them. Um, always include all decision makers. This is huge. I mean, if you've got a husband and a wife and one of them's communicated with all the time because you think they're the decision maker and you find out that that's not the case, it's, it's, it's bad for you, right? So I usually tell people when I sit down with them, um, I'd like to include you both on the communications that I write. If I do have to talk with someone and get in touch with someone immediately, who should that person be and get their permission to identify one? Because if you just start talking to one, then it's a problem. I have had people, I had, I had a woman actually do this to me because I was talking with the husband and I always addressed them as his name first. And she said, I always wondered why you did that. I was wondering if it was some sort of, what was the word she used was, um, male bias. And I was like, I, I'm just stupid. I'm like, I just, it was just the way I always address them, right? So now I've taken to when I address people, switching it up just for the sake of doing it so they don't think anything, right? But you do have to be sensitive to that. Uh, and you also can find that they may be in the middle of a divorce, 
and they don't want to tell you. And if you're talking to one and not the other, you're going to be in trouble. All right. Uh, great attitude. Always be enthusiastic and positive. Um, excellent customer service experience will set you apart. At the end of the day, that is what will make them refer you. Um, you can do a great job for them, but if they didn't really like you, they're not going to refer you to other people. Um, what is the impact of what is what does under promise over deliver mean? No, under promise over deliver. Right. Right. So, what's an example of uh, that you've experienced as a customer of some uh, under promising and over delivering? As long as they are okay with that, yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. I think I can get this done in the next forty-eight hours, and then you call me like it's done. Right. Right. Absolutely. You want to be doing that as much as possible. Setting realistic expectations and beating them. Right. Um, I think that in general, you're going to want to make sure that you don't promise anything that you can't deliver on. All right. Um, be solutions oriented. Make it a habit to never communicate with a client about a problem without having one or more solutions to recommend. This is huge. Clients are looking to you to be the expert, right? Don't bring me a problem if you can't tell me what to do about it. All right? And then develop uh, resources for all these, um, these uh, vendors that you're going to need. And then I think that that's pretty much the end with the exception of the listing presentation. You guys, have you guys, did they do the listing presentation? You didn't do that yet. Right, so you guys are going to need to do, you, there's going to be a class on how to do the listing presentation. So you're supposed to do that before you got to this class, but we just kind of kept scheduled because I was scheduled for this week. So you will go back and you will do the actual listing presentation. It is important for you guys to have a well-prepared buyer and seller presentation that you, you present to somebody, okay? Um, it has to hit on all the major points and concerns that they have so that you're able to answer every question and overcome every objection that they have. And you'll find over time what questions will come up. And pretty much, my I don't use the one from KW because we've been using our uh, personal one for years, but I've looked through it and it's, I mean, it's good. The content of it is good. You might choose to jazz it up a little bit, but there's a balance of form and function Right? I want everything to look really good versus I want it to work really good. Don't choose looking good over working good. It has to work good. Right? So I, I was a web designer before and I'd always balance like the programmers who'd be like, this is what we need to do to make it work. And the designers would be like, well, this is what is going to make people use it because it looks good. Well, if it looks good but it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Right? Always make sure it works and then refine, refine, refine. You guys have heard of uh, rapid prototyping? Right? Do something quick. See if you can get it done in 30 minutes. What's the best you can do in 30 minutes? Don't spend six months getting it perfect before it actually works. Get something that works in 30 minutes and then say, in the next week, I'm going to spend an hour refining it. And then I'll get as much done as I can in an hour and I'll have something that works. And then I'll use it a couple times and then I'll refine it again, refine it again. Um, I have had that be a problem for me myself where I get caught up on, I want it to be perfect. And four years later, I still haven't done it, you know? So that's, uh, just my two cents for you. All right. The videos are great. They're great videos. No, I'm just saying I see video and it I'm going to show you a video right now. You want to see a video? No, they are, they are, they are, you can watch them all on your own and your student resources. You don't oh, have access to, you don't have access to the website. Because I'm so... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome! Hey! All right. All right. Any, any last questions? All right. Um, I tell people, um, I really like the idea of the people that stand in front of people and be like, listen, come to me anytime I have an open door policy. Yeah. I don't. 
Okay. We do two meetings a month uh, ourselves. One is uh, called KPI, keeping uh, KCM, Keeping Current Matters, which is where we actually watch a webinar once a month for an hour over lunch um, that talks about national real estate statistics. And the idea of that is that you are educated about what is being said in the USA Today and the New York Times so that when your clients are reading it, you can say, well, that is true around the country. And then we go into local market statistics and say, here's what matters here. All right. So you can have those intelligent conversations as a trusted advisor. That's once a month for an hour. And then we also have um, what we call um, third Thursdays, which is basically like this is kind of outside of the realm of KW, but they allow us to do it here. It's a lunch where we kind of just do a, a fellowship Bible study, if you will. So I tell everybody, eat the meat, spit out the bones. I don't care what faith you are. If you want to come and just learn about it, you're welcome to do that. I'm the chaplain for the Nationals. That's like my volunteer deal is um, outside of this. So it's just one of the things that I say, we buy lunch and, and people can come here for, for lunch. So, uh, but those are the two places where I make myself fully available. If anybody wants to come and ask me questions, that's the time to do it. They are advertised on the office um, schedule. So, and, and I also will do lunches with people um, if you want to talk. I do have like several lunches a month that I just kind of reserve where if anybody wants me to ask questions, we just run over to Dogwood and we'll, we'll do that. So that's that's my availability. So you keep talking about um, we in terms of the presentation. Yeah. What is, how many is we? This is Rachel. Rachel's our office manager. Um, so she does the transaction coordination and it, uh, on the website, PearsonRealEstate.com, you might want to write that down because that's PearsonRealEstate.com under resources, market statistics, or where all the market stats are. Um, me, me and my wife started it about 12 years ago, my wife and I. Um, Liz, uh, we worked together for, no, she did it full time for two years while I kept my job. Then I joined her. We did it together for a year. That must have been fun. It was. It actually was fun. But she was the boss. I mean, she'd been doing it full time for two years, and I joined her, and I was we were doing junior Tim. Doing yeah, I worked at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. I did marketing and design there. No, <laughs> I used the KW one. I thought I was gonna. Here's the thing. Here's the big aha. I <laughs> thought I would come into the real estate market. My parents have been my whole life. I wanted nothing to do with it. And then I sat behind a computer for ten years. I was like, oh, this doesn't look so bad. Um, I thought I would come into real estate and revolutionize real estate with technology, <laughs> right? And I realized it's it's all about relationships. Yeah. People want to know, like, and trust you. They're making the biggest decision of their life. Don't tell me that you care. Show me that you care. Mm -hmm. I don't want to read a website about how here's the 20 reasons why you're the best deal in the, in the world. I want to look you in the eye and be like, you're not going to screw me, right? Like, you care about me. This is my family. This is where we're going to have Christmas. This is where we're going to raise our kids. These are the neighborhoods that we're going to live in. I want to know that, that, that I'm making a good decision. And that's ultimately what we do. We're a trusted advisor. We're walking them through that. We're not trying to sell anybody anything. We're trying to give them the best information to make great decisions for their families. And the great thing about this for me is, is we know that when you help someone buy a home, they're going to be better citizens. They're going to care more about their home. They're going to care more about the neighborhood. They're going to invest in their communities. They're going to take care of their neighbors. They're going to pick up the trash, and it just creates a better community for everybody. So as we help people do that wisely, they're able to know what their payments are going to look like for the next 30 years so they don't have to worry about moving 10 times over the next 10 years and what the rent's going to be and do we have enough money for this stuff and this stuff because they know now we have a fixed cost in the housing thing. We can start to have more margin in our life to invest in other areas. And it's, it's just a good thing. I mean, this, it's a great profession. It's constantly changing. It's very competitive. But if you do it well, it can be very good. And you can help a lot of people. So, oh, sorry. So, so my wife and I got uh, into it together. Then we had uh, our first child, our first nanny was hired, found out we were pregnant again, like a hot second later. So we told our nanny, like, listen, we're not going to need you because Liz is going to stay home. We actually hired her to be our transaction coordinator. That's Chantel. She's still on our team 12 years later, whatever it is, um, 10 years later. Um, and then we got a, a buyer agent to kind of help. And now we have a marketing uh, gal, Heather, who works with us. And uh, TJ is on my team. He's, he's kind of the number two realtor. Chantel's on our team. And then 
Rachel basically runs all of the non-agent stuff for our team. So there's six of us total. My wife at this point, we have three girls under that are under nine. So she's mostly at home with the kids, um, which, you know, fortunately this business has given us the opportunity to do. So that's the team. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, please. All right, so I know we got off track, not to say because of the location we had, but uh, really make an effort to go through your to dos, your 10 4, which is 10, that, 10 people to your database, 10 phone calls, 10 notes, and then that's every day, and then 10 homes a week go view. And you can't do that yet, but um, just kind of, you're just soaking in right now. But I said, really get on. The main thing, too, try to go online, register it, track it, track your numbers, track your numbers, track your numbers. It's all about tracking. When you, when I, you watch what you look at, that's what grows. If you're not tracking your numbers, you don't know where you are, it's not going to happen. So tomorrow we'll try to get a little bit more intense on the actual accountability. I know we kind of little kind of leeway there because the last couple of days. Yes, sir? What time is class tomorrow? Class tomorrow at 12.30. Team meetings in the morning. So tomorrow class is 12.30 or 3. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Um, also, too, just FYI, the makeup for our last Thursday's class is going to be Friday. We're adding two days to the schedule, Monday and Wednesday. So the last Friday's class is actually going to be Monday, and then what would have been this Friday's class is going to be Wednesday. This is all assuming we have no more snow issues or weather issues. I don't know what's happening tomorrow. I know today, today they already close and early closings and stuff, and so what happens tonight, tomorrow, watch, watch Sheila's email. Sheila sends an email. Are you on the KW list? you getting Sheila's emails? Not yet. Okay. So email me tomorrow like you did today. Email me tomorrow. Tomorrow's 1230. There's a team meeting. Every, every Tuesday, we have a team meeting from 11 to 12. Okay. Every Tuesday, this room is packed with a team meeting. So the team meeting is from 10 to 11 to 12, and then Ignite will start at 1230 to 3. So it's like a half hour shorter than normal, but just because of the team meeting. Then from there on out. Yes, absolutely. Yep. And then, of course, those of us in productivity, 9 o'clock. Wednesday will be 9 to 12. The rest of the time will be 9 to, 9 to 12. Monday, Monday, Thursday, Friday will be 9 to 12. Monday and Wednesday next week will be 9 to 12. And it's all makeup. Uh, no, no. Makeup will be Friday, Monday, and Friday will be the, Wednesday will be the last class. Yeah. You'll, 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 you'll catch on. Like I said, it's a, it's a fire hose, especially if you haven't got your license yet. Or anything. You haven't signed your paperwork yet. You, yeah. Trust me. Then that starts the following Thursday, next Thursday, yeah. And then, so contract class, contract boot camp. That's where you learn about all the contracts. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be in here. Everything, almost all the big classes are in here. And then, um, for, yeah, for those doing fully during night, if you have any questions about your, what your homeworks are and your activities, let me know. Each morning, I'm going to come and check in and say, hey, hey, did you make calls? Hey, did you write notes? I mean, if you did, the goal is 10. If you did five, that's great. But let's, let's, let's try to push for this week to really get it going. I know it's a condensed week. Normally, this, this class is over a whole month. We're doing it in eight days, so it's not quite as much time to do what you can do. But really, look at the MRS. If you can go see one or two houses, that would be great. Like I said, I really, especially for the newer agents, I mean, it's, it's what you get. It's how you start learning. I, I never realized how much I learned until I walk into a house and start for my first time. And you get to start getting those nuances of opening the doors, opening the central locks, opening the combo locks, talking to the other agents, setting up the appointments. That's what you do and do on a regular basis as an agent. So as soon as you start doing it, now before you have clients, <laughs> a lot better you can be when you have a client with you and you, you're struggling to get into a house. So any questions before we wrap up today? Good. All right. We'll see you tomorrow at the team meeting and then 12 o'clock, 1230. Thanks, guys.